And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for an epic one. I think this is going to be a total blast. We have Creation and Evolution on trial with Kent Hovind and Mark Drisdale, an animal specialist. I think this is going to be a blast, so want to let you know just a few things as we get this debate cracking. First up, if you have any questions, feel free to fire them into the live chat, and I will pull them out, put them in a list, and we'll ask them during the Q&A at the end. Also, if this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we've got a lot more debates coming up. In fact, we are very excited as we will have a is Trump racist debate. That will be a provocative one. Very juicy. So we are uh, excited to have a lot more debates coming up. Be free. Uh, be sure to hit that little bell notification if you want reminders of when those debates are happening as well. And want to let you know, both of our speakers have their links in the description. So if you are enjoying what you are hearing, you can conveniently click, conveniently click on their links just below that are waiting right down there for you. And with that, we want to say thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, this really it is modern day debate is kind of like an abstract entity. It's and it's really the value is from the speakers, the guests that we get to have on. We owe them big time. And so want to ask if you can do us a favor, your questions and super chats that you do send in. If you want to do us a favor and one keeping the questions germane to the subject that is being debated today, as well as as once in a while we do have a personal attack, believe it or not, in the questions or the super chats. And so we just want to ask if you can respect oh those people, the, our guests that we have here today. I feel like I personally owe them because we, we really appreciate them being here. And also I almost forgot to mention that we will have super chats. Basically, it gives you a chance to make a comment or a statement like citing a study or something that you want to cite. And it will also go to the very top of the list for the question and answer. So with that... We are thrilled to let this thing get rolling. We have 10 minutes of opening statements. Mark will be going first, followed by 40 minutes of open discussion, and then 10 minutes of Q&A. So with that, thrilled to have you here, gentlemen. Thanks very much for being here today. Thank you so much, James. So yes, uh, actually, I was on the live chat and got to hear about Bill. This is new news for me. It's shooken me a little bit. So if my uh, opening statement's a little off, I got to be honest with you. I've talked to the man uh, a couple times. I had the honor to talk to him on the phone. And uh, it's, it's, it's very disturbing. I did not even know that he was sick. And it's funny because we were sitting in the a uh, moment of silence, and I was thinking back to the Kent Hovind, uh, Bill Ludlow debate, and thinking uh, thinking back to that and some of the stuff that I'd heard on there. But uh, yes, Bill was a good man. If any of his family's out there, he uh, did a lot of really good work. But uh, in preparing for this debate, I started to look into this is an evolution versus creation of debate. And as I started to look into this more and more, I started to go down more of Kent's rabbit holes that were, um, I don't even know what word I would use, except basically unbelievable. Um, most of Kent's beliefs fly, fly in the face of everything that we understand in reality, the real world around us, and uh, just in general, everything that we see happening day in and day out, Kent's beliefs pretty much on everything uh, fly in the face of science, flies in the face of math, flies in the face of uh, uh, physics, and yet he claims to be a 15-year um, high school teacher, which I really cannot understand. So I am going to allow Kent today to use his six levels of evolution, even, even though I cannot possibly understand how um, the beginning of the cosmos has anything to do with um, the evolution of animals from a single-celled um, organism all the way up into if we want to consider man to be the supreme being into man. But uh, I'm going to allow that for Kent today because I'm hoping to use that in my favor as well when it comes to him trying to explain some of the uh, some of his beliefs back to me. I'm going to use that uh, that exact uh, six, seven, possibly eight um, levels of evolution as well. So I, I hope that the moderator allows that and uh, gives me that uh, that free um, way to to kind of use this uh, in in my opinion a way of using the word. Uh, evolution that I have never thought of using it before. 
Um, Kent, some of Kent's beliefs when it comes to the flood, um, actually, that is obviously going to uh, work its way into this evolution uh, um, debate in the fact that uh, after Kent's flood, we only have approximately 4,000 years to um, produce all of the different cats that we see on Earth today, all the different dogs that we see on Earth, the wolves, um, all the way from the penguin to the hummingbird. So I'm going to be really interested to hear from Kent um, if it's a bird kind, how we can go from a hummingbird to a penguin, which basically flies in water. Um, there's lots of things that I'd like to go over here with Kent. I really hope that we have the time. So I would like to myself um donate some of this opening time into just a back and forth discussion because i know kent always says that he wants to do this question by question he doesn't like it when we do the gish gallop or the hoven hustle as uh as tony uh called it last week i believe so um yeah at that point i i would just like to say that uh everything that i know about animals is completely um polar opposites to the way kent uh believes that animals have gotten to the point that where they're at today the amount of species that we have uh the possibility of 1.3 billion species of terrestri terrestrial animals fitting on an arc um how we could possibly handle the ammonia how we could possibly handle the amount of heat that that many animals would produce. We're up here in Canada and in the winter to keep our kangaroos and zebras warm, we will put a few cows in our barn. So you've got a thousand square foot barn, we'll put 10 cows in it and it'll more than keep that barn at 55 to 60 degrees on a minus five degree day. So I'd like to hear from Kent where that heat went from or went to. We know where it came from, but I'd like to know where it went to when uh, from everything that i read in the bible i believe there was one door and one window so i'm thinking that must have been one hell of a window um so yeah let's let's get into the discussion portion i want kent to you know start his mantra here of dogs produce dogs and uh, everything else that we've heard back and forth but i'm sure he'll take his his time to do that and let's hear about the dogs kent and then we'll uh we'll get into the back and forth well thank you sir you donate your time to me i appreciate that there you uh, go the Bible says pretty clearly, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God is claiming that he did it. And in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him. And we see later that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the book of John certainly teaches that Jesus was God in the flesh and that he created all things. Colossians 1 repeats that. By him, that's Jesus, were all things created in heaven and earth. So uh, your position obviously is, is saying that the, a the bible is wrong or jesus is lying or both uh jesus claimed he was god almighty in the flesh and i happen to believe that and jesus said have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female which was obviously adam and eve so i think everybody that knows the bible would certainly say whether they believe it or not the bible teaches the creation of adam and eve was the beginning we see that in mark 10 6 and matthew 19 4. So Jesus said the creation of well, the beginning was when God made Adam and Eve. And the Bible clearly teaches that man brought death into the world, whereas your religion of evolution teaches death brought man into the world. Death is a wonderful thing. All the inferiors have to die so that the superior one can take over the gene code. And that is Adolf Hitler 101 in my humble, totally unbiased opinion. So the Bible says that man brought death into the world, not death brought man into the world. So Jesus said the creation of, the, of Adam and Eve was the beginning. The Bible says nothing died till Adam sinned. And the evolution theory is in complete opposition to that. And I don't know how anybody can believe the evolution theory. So let me skip a few things here. I, I just want to point out that certainly the Bible does teach the earth is about 6,000 years old. It says Adam was the first man and he lived 130 years and had a son and that boy lived 105 and he lived 90. You can make a chart and graph it out like many people have seen my chart. And it clearly comes to about 4,000 BC for the creation. And then 16 or 1700 years later, a big flood in the days of Noah. So the textbooks though teach the kids, the earth is 4.543 billion years old. Somebody is seriously wrong on their math. Is it 6,000 or 4.543 billion years old? And uh, six weeks since I got the slide, okay. Uh, so textbook says, earth is thought to have formed 4.6 billion years ago. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. So was he lying? Did he not understand science? Or could it even possibly be that he was right? Now, the topic of the debate tonight is the meaning of this word evolution. 
And I think this is where all the confusion comes in. What does that word evolution mean? The textbook says, life too has evolved on earth. Wait, wait, wait. What does this word evolve mean? And I spell out, and you asked if we could discuss the meaning of the word evolution. I break it up into six categories, and so does the internet. And so do the textbooks. Uh, the first one is cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. Where did time, space, and matter come from? Before you can have any evolution from an amoeba to a whale, you have to have space for this to happen in, you have to have matter, and you have to have time. You guys want to start the clock time at about 13.7 billion years ago. Well, what was before that? Or was there a before that? Uh, where did time come from? Who created time? Who's created space? Who created matter? The textbooks and the internet certainly talk a lot about cosmic evolution. Why cosmic evolution matters. There's an article, Cosmic Evolution from Big Bang to Humankind. This is certainly part of the evolution theory, the Big Bang where nothing exploded and produced time, space, matter, according to the theory. Access this today. What is the theory of cosmic evolution? Simply defined, this is from physicalcentral.com. Cosmic evolution is the study of change, the vast number of developmental and generative, uh, generative changes that have accumulated during all time and across all space from Big Bang to humankind. So there is such a thing as cosmic evolution. Secondly, there would have to be what we call chemical evolution. All the elements would have to arise from the so-called hydrogen gas that came from this Big Bang. A third theory of life's origin is known as chemical evolution. In this idea, prebiological changes slowly transform simple atoms and molecules into the more complex chemicals needed to produce. How do you get from, there's no such thing, by the way, as a simple molecule, but how do you get from a single, like hydrogen, to uranium or platinum or gold or silver? Man, if you can turn hydrogen gas into gold or silver, I'd like to know how to do that. I think a lot of people would love to do it. I think all the alchemists in the 13th century tried that. There's access today. Chemical evolution, the formation of complex organic molecules from simpler inorganic molecules through chemical reactions from dictionary.com. Oh, the internet is full of it. You can just Google chemical evolution. You get a thousands and thousands of, 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 of results from that, okay? So according to the Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang produced hydrogen gas and maybe a little bit of helium and maybe some lithium or deuterium. Uh, and then how do you get this to evolve? Where is the energy coming from to change this into the higher elements? There's a real problem. You can't fuse past iron. I think people that understand the fusion of chem lower chemicals to higher elements realize this can't happen without way more input than you get for your results. So it's just, I think chemical evolution is a giant stumbling block for those who believe in evolution. That's why they want to skip over all of this and go straight to once life gets started. They're very embarrassed because they cannot explain the first three, I think the first four. Number three, stellar and planetary evolution. Obviously, we're all standing or sitting on a large planet called Earth, about 8,000 miles in diameter, 79, 26, depending if you're equatorial or polar. But it bulges a little bit the equator, so do I. But that's, that's a different story. Uh, stellar and planetary evolution. How did the stars and planets get here? Nobody's ever seen a star form. But the Internet is full, and so are the textbooks. I've got them all behind me here. Earth science and physical science textbooks talk about stellar evolution. The process by which a star changes over the course of time, depending on the mass of the star. Stellar evolution. Fuel consumption stages and their finality is important because it's responsible for the production of most of the elements after helium and hydrogen. Really? So th this was accessed a few months ago, there last month. They do indeed teach stellar evolution. And yet those who are experts in science will say, we don't know how a single star managed to form. How did the stars form? Nobody has a clue. Why do stars evolve? Western Michigan University. Short answer is because changes in a star's core, where fusion is occurring, must result in changes throughout the rest of the star, including the surface. That's not an answer. That's a theory. That's a story. Stellar evolution. You can just Google that. They talk about the life cycle of stars, starting from a stellar nebula and slowly either turning into an uh, uh, average star or a massive star. The internet is full of this, and so is the text. That's my objection. This isn't science. We've never seen any star evolving into anything else. We've certainly never seen the production of a star out of a gas cloud. The origin of stars is one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary physics. Stars are born, 
out of the gravitational collapse of cool, dense molecular clouds. You tell the author of this one at swin.edu.au, I think they're either stupid or lying. Nobody has ever seen a cloud of dust or gas accumulate into a solid. There's, you're a mechanical engineer, so was my dad and brother. Gas clouds expand. You have to contain them in containers. They don't collect automatically. They don't have any gravitational attraction to collect into a solid. This is absolutely physically impossible. It doesn't happen. But they claim it did a whole bunch of time because there's a lot of stars out there. Everybody on Earth could own 11 trillion of them to yourself. Stars are formed in giant gas clouds of dust and gas. This is simply a lie or somebody's extremely stupid about mechanics. Gases, this boils gas laws. You cannot squeeze those into a solid without enormous input. It's hard to compress gases uh, and to make a, just a liquid. Like check liquid nitrogen, see what they got to do. No one understands how star formation proceeds. It's really remarkable, Scientific American said years ago. But they, we see stars blow up, nova or supernova. That happens quite often. That's been seen many times, okay? How many stars are there in the universe? Well, you can Google that and see 70 billion trillion, that is 70 sextillion stars is the current estimate of stars visible from Earth with our current telescopes. And I guess enough to have to go for four days on that one. The Bible claims very clearly that God one simply minute. made the stars, and he did it on day four, which would be after the Earth was made. This exact opposite order of what the evolution theory teaches. And God told Abraham, look to the stars. If you can count the stars, you'll be able to count your offspring and descendants. And all the Jews and Arabs and several other nations over there are descendants of good old father Abraham. Current estimate is 70 sextillion stars, they say maybe three times more than that, are in the observable universe. That's enough for everybody to own 11 trillion to yourself. That means if there are 70 sextillion stars and the universe has been here 13 billion years, you do the math, we should see 9.7 million new stars forming every minute. Every minute should be 9.7 million new stars. Now, the atheist's obvious way out of this is to say, well, it all happened already before we got here. So we're not here to observe it because it happened before we got here. That's seconds. real convenient. My point is this is not science. This is something somebody believes in. Number four is organic evolution. We lost our slide there. James, are you on, still on screen there? Yep, I still see you. But does everybody see the slides? Yeah, I still see you. I definitely see does your Does everybody slides. in the audience see the slides? I know you see them. Does everybody else see them is the question. I'm looking at the... Uh... Something, something changed. Okay. Anyway, organic evolution is the origin of life. Those of you who would like to believe in this evolution religion have to somehow for, find a way for non-living material to come alive. The theories of organic evolution explain conv explains convincing the origin of life. And it also explains time. how the... Forgive me. Uh, that was uh, 10 minutes. So if you... Wait, guys... oh, he gave me come of his minutes, though, didn't he? Oh, I think. No, was... I want that to go into discussion. I've heard all this evolution stuff before, too. We'll talk about the evolution of cars, the evolution of square wheels to round wheels. Okay. The word evolution can be put in front of anything and uh, can be made an, an argument for it. Um, right. So I guess it would be my turn to answer him. So, um, for one thing, if you want to go see stars being born, go to the baby boom cluster. They're showing that um, many, many stars are being formed there. Um, I forget what the number was. I, I believe it was around 30 a day they're watching. And it's called the Baby Boom Cluster. Um, right there, you'll see some stars being made. How did we end up with things over iron? That's just obvious. It would be, the Big Bang Theory would tell us exactly what we see on Earth. We would expect there to be a lot of iron. We'd expect a lot of stuff to be fused up to the point of iron. And then we'd expect the rest of the stuff to be much harder uh, to find. Much less of it we would find on Earth. And that's exactly what we find. We find lots and lots of iron. Our, our center core is made out of iron. Tons of iron. Lots of uh, lots of stars forming, lots of iron being produced. Um, you get into your supernovas, you get into things exploding. That's where you get your heavy elements. We know this. We, we've been through this. Uh, we've understood this now for, I believe, almost 100 years. I'm not sure why the creationists don't know it. Um, what were some of your other evolution stuff there? You had a simple molecule. I've heard you talk about this before, Kent, how there's no such thing as a simple molecule, that, um, that the single cell is more complex than a uh, space shuttle. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm a machinist. Um, I worked on one of the valves with a company out of Fort Erie called uh, Aerosafe. 
And we made a valve for, it was a hydraulic valve that worked for the landing gear. It worked for a bunch of the hydraulic systems. And when we were done building that part and putting all the coordinates that were needed in telling those tools where to go to drill those those holes on a five axis machine, we almost took up a terabyte of information. So that is, if you want to look at information as complexity, that is telling where the tool where to go, how fast the tools travel, how deep it's to cut into the material, where it's to cut in, where it's to tap the thread, what the pitch of the thread will be. And that was up in the terabytes. We know that we can fit the whole genome of uh, a human being on a, what, 750 megabyte uh, CD-ROM. I'm not a computer guy, but I think that's about what they are. And I've been told that you can easily fit our entire uh, our entire genome onto a, a single CD-ROM. Kent, I'll let you go from there because uh, there's just so much stuff here that, like I said, flies in the face of what we know. So uh, go at it again for a little bit and then let's try to get more into a one-on-one. -on -one. There's a lot of stuff that I missed here. Yeah, you had the simple molecule, you had the energy coming in. Um, the Big Bang Theory is very solid. I, I really don't know where um, there's confusion in the Big Bang Theory. Um, if we want to move that over towards the claim that you have, that uh, the evolutionists are always trying to push time um, and get more time for their prince to turn or their frog to turn into a prince. Nothing could be further from the truth. You tell us it's 20 billion years that uh, scientists say since the uh, Big Bang, and uh, actually we're closer to the uh, 13, 14 billion years. So we're continuing to take time away, Ken. We're not asking for more time. And then when it comes to anything beyond simple life, just give us 750 million years. We don't need billions. We had simple single celled life up to 700 million years ago. That's when we say that life really started to take hold and uh, start crawling out of the ocean, start to build the trees. Um, yeah, that's when complexity started 750 million years ago. We don't need the 12 billion years. Tell you what, you can have, um, you can have 11 billion of those years back and we're still good with building the life that we have on on earth today and its complexity and its variation go ahead okay you said you made hydraulic mm -hmm. valves uh and it took a terabyte of information is there any possibility that those valves could have made themselves from without intelligent input a terabyte's a lot of information oh yeah it's it's huge and it's a lot of coordinates and that's what i'm saying that space shuttle is an extremely complex um piece of machinery with a mm -hmm. lot of coordinates so if you just look at it on the on the uh, point of how much information is needed to build something um, in the world of machining, when you get down into machining things to a tenth of a thou, like a lot of the stuff was on the space shuttle, you're talking huge amounts of uh, huge amounts of information. So I would completely disagree that the space shuttle is less complex than a single cell. Um, to me, a single cell is is a bunch of chemicals. It's a bunch of chemicals put together in different ways. I understand that we uh, we um, assign letters to those uh to those chemicals but i do not see it as as completely uh um, impossible as what you do well i guess i'm asking could the valves that you build for the hydraulics on the space shuttle could they have possibly happened by chance or did it take some intelligent input Oh, absolutely. It takes intelligent input. Yes, absolutely, Kent. But I don't know where you're going to go with on that one. Well, I know exactly where you're going to go. You don't yes. think there's intelligent input on making a cell? No, absolutely not. No, I don't think but there is intelligent input on making. So do you yeah. believe you believe the valves on the space shuttle hydraulic were, were designed by somebody with some level of intelligence? Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Do you think uh, the whole space shuttle was designed with some in, by some intelligent people? Absolutely. I don't think there's anyone that's going to disagree with that. Okay. We see it think, every day. Do you think your brain was designed by anybody with any intelligence? Absolutely not. You may be right on that one. My okay. mom and dad. <laughs> my mom and dad pulled her together, that's for sure. Okay. Well, the DNA code to make the human brain, which is capable <laughs> of holding a whole bunch of information, is unbelievably complex just because the code only can can all fit on a cd-rom i don't know that that's true it's interesting i don't think we completely understand the dna code because it's three-dimensional and it it's it, it, not only three-dimensional but just the loops where it loops around and touches itself again carries more information all of our computer codes i think nearly all of our computer codes carry it with just a two-bit you know plus minus or yes no 
on-off switching of the binary code that all of our computer language is written in, yet DNA code is written in a four-letter code, C-A-T-G, which makes it multiple levels of more complexity than simple binary code. So I, I have to disagree. I still would stick by my statement that uh, a single cell in your body is more complex than the space shuttle. I think you, you would quickly agree that the space shuttle have to, had to have a designer, but you don't think a cell had to have a designer. Do you think all the cells in your body and my body and all the animals in the world, all of that was fit into a dot smaller than a period on a page? Is, it, is that your position? Oh, absolutely. We see it right now. We see it in black holes. We have, we have no problems with singularities. We understand them completely. There's there's no problems with figuring out uh, singularities. And if you actually think about it on on the molecular level, think about how little little matter is in an atom. There's nothing in it. 99.9998% at empty space. I think there's more zeros to throw in there. But yeah, I have absolutely no problems with uh, compressing things down to that point. And you're not really talking compressing when you get to, uh, um, you know, the singularity. There's a lot more to it than that. There's the temperatures, there's uh, a lot of stuff going on. So it's not as simple <laughs> as just to say, will my Chevy van fit inside of a uh, a, a space as, as small as a dot on a page that that is just a dishonest way of looking at um, a very complex situation which is what we get into when we talk about the singularity but yes we, we see it already wow. we know what goes on in a black hole and uh your chevy van would fit nicely in a in a black hole and it would become smaller than a dot on a page i guarantee it well i years ago i heard that a mile-long freight train just by removing the space in the atoms between the electrons a mile long freight train would probably fit in a thimble. That's used to be the illustration they would use. Uh, but you're, so you're saying all of the stars, all of the planets, all of the life forms on earth were inside a singularity. Is that your position? Yeah, I have no problems with that at all. Absolutely no, problem no with problems okay. with it. We, we know exactly what would happen. We know that as far as we know, there's no limit to the amount of energy that we can put into a system. Um, the only time that the math starts to break down is when we get to the Planck frequency, which is the maximum theoretical amount of energy that you can put into a space but yeah nothing starts to break down um you know no that that's that's where we're fitting god in a lot of times is where the math starts to break down when we get into very complex um uh mathematical situations but uh trying to visualize a chevy van fitting into a dot on a period of a page of course it's not intuitive but we're not talking about um standard atmospheric conditions here on earth where we're dealing with the strong force the weak force the electromagnetic force and gravity we're we're talking about gravity here beyond anything that anyone could imagine and that is what we see right now in a black hole so yes you take even more matter and put it into a black hole you're even going to get more of a dense spot i i have absolutely no problems uh envisioning uh singularity and i i don't think science has any problems with it anymore whatsoever either when you say that's what you see in a black hole has anybody yeah. ever seen do you see no we don't fly hole? around and go into black holes but we know what's going on we know light can't get out and uh we we have a pretty good, good idea what's going on in there so yeah you know i i don't know if anyone's actually uh figured out exactly i know no one's been in one that's for sure because you get into one you're not getting out hold on i thought we all came from one we all did get out <clears throat> well something happened didn't it something pushed uh time forward and caused uh, the irradiation to do exactly what it did and here we are today and and yes you know i know we're supposed to get into evolution here but i guess we needed somewhere to put the animals first didn't we well yes uh, so all of the matter in the universe in your in your and it is a religion in your religion all of the matter in the universe was in this black hole and all of the energy how much total energy is would there be? What's the total? Uh, you're an engineer. What would the total number of joules be of the all the universe, all the stars, everything? Well, like I said, it doesn't matter what it is, but we know there's no limit to the amount of energy that we can put into a system. That that's just a fact. We know that. So whatever the number ends up being is what the end the number ends up being. All that it eventually starts to happen is as the temperature goes up, the frequency goes up, and you get the Planck length of the frequency. So that will be where the math will start to break down. Is when we get to the point where the where the energy is so high in frequency that the math will start to break down. That that is the only point that and, and that is where unfortunately the young Earth creationists always try to slide their gods in. Is when our math breaks down. 
down, when our understanding breaks down, and you're always trying to fit these gods into these areas that we don't understand. You did it thousands of years ago when, uh, you know, a man would come home and find out that his wife, children, babies, everybody was dead. It must have been something that he did wrong. No, it was a virus. No, it was a plague. It was a parasite. It was whatever took out his family. We know that now. So now we no longer have gods that are punishing us for our day-to-day -day deeds by taking our families. We understand what's going on. It's the same as floods. It's the same as lightning. It's the same as uh, when a monsoon comes through. Um, we understand now where these things are coming from. Kent, there is absolutely no doubt that we still have work to do. No one, you've heard this time and time again. And I bet you I've heard every single one of your debates and there is no doubt there's holes. We have a lot to work on. But um, at the same time, I just cannot stand the fact that, uh, you know, there's people like yourself. And when I say like yourself, I do say it with a bit of respect because you are passionate about what you do. But you continue to look for these holes of things that we don't understand and think it's the I got you moment. And it's really not. Okay, you, you have used the word we probably several hundred times already tonight. We know this, we know that, we see this. Would you agree that nobody has ever actually seen a black hole? Uh, you Obviously, if no light is escaping, you, this is something you just, you, no, nobody can see such a thing. Oh, no, we've seen, uh, we've seen things go in. Actually, I believe it was about two months ago, I heard that two black holes had um, joined up and we got to see a... I forget what they called it, but it was something to do with the two, the uh, gravitational waves. We got to experience the gravitational waves from these two black holes combining. And uh, from what I remember reading a little bit on the paper, it was almost exactly mathematically what they expected it to be. And it was by a complete fluke that we even ended up seeing it because they built this machine to detect these gravitational waves. And they just had it on just by chance, both of them, because there's one on one side of the the country and one on the other side I'm you know I'm taking this out of memory it was just something I, I glazed over quickly and uh, yeah it, it pretty much uh, proved again that uh, the scientific method worked perfectly we we predicted it and uh, it happened and it was very close to the measurements that we we had expected I guess I'd be real curious to see how you could how you could see a gravitational wave well they measure them measure it with what well, they measured it with these huge machines that they built. Have you not seen these? Like, you got to check into this stuff, Kent. These, these people are working diligently to build these machines to further our knowledge. And it, it, that is the, pro, the, the program that they're working on. Google it. These uh, gravitational wave uh, yeah, sure. detectors that they've built. They've built one on <clears throat> one side of the country. They built one somewhere else. I don't know if it's in Canada. I don't know where it is. But uh, these things are, I, I believe, they're about three or four kilometers long. And they're just detecting the the difference of the uh the gravitational wave as it goes across this long i don't even know what it is could be a shaft i don't pretend to know things that i don't know about but when i see things that interest me i read a little bit about it just enough to uh say oh that was interesting but that doesn't mean that it's not real it just means that now you need to go google it look up these uh these machines that they've built they're not machines they're detectors and you will see exactly how they measure gravity gravitational waves and yes these these waves are infinitely small and they're so blown away that they could do it and and that's the part Kent that really bothers me about your worldview is that this work that that we yes it's we the people who want to know are looking into we're finding these things and we're learning these things and it, it's exciting it's it's more exciting than anything that magic could ever give me well, I, you can certainly include me in one of those who wants to know and wants to understand. I just do you have can. A do you really want to know? I really do. Okay, really that's want, good. I, that's I really good. Want to, I really want to understand how you, as an animal behaviorist, can believe dogs, all the 339 recognized breeds of dogs in the world today, came from a single cell creature, like something like an amoeba. You do believe that, don't you? Oh, absolutely, Kent. And the funny thing is, is, I've heard you talking about dogs become dogs for so long that there is no better representation of dogs when it comes to evolution. 
just look at your chart, Kent. We have dogs that weigh less than a pound all the way up to dogs that weigh 250, 270 pounds. We have dogs that can specialize in smelling. We have dogs that specialize in swimming. We have dogs that specialize in running. Um, you always talk about if they want a faster horse, why don't they get a, a horse? You know, all we've been able to do is to get it to run five miles an hour faster, which is an incredible feat over 150 years or whatever they've done it. But right in your picture right there, Kent, you've got dogs that can maybe run, what, 15 kilometers an hour all the way up to the ground, the uh, Greyhound, which is, I, I believe, is up around the 45, 50 mile an hour area. So there's a huge uh uh, divergence in uh, in the gene pool right in front of you. So you're very, uh, dogs only produce dogs, which is wrong. It's wolves produce dogs. But uh, it right there is is evolution 101 if I've ever seen it. And I, I just don't know how you don't see it that way. Well, I, th I think I, just, I see it even more clearly than you do. You said there's dogs from one pound up to 270 pounds. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, do you think do you think they'll ever be able to crossbreed dogs and get a dog as uh, up to three ton? Well, why would they want to though? What would no, no, be no, the natural it, What would be the it, natural advantage for a dog that weighs three tons unless you're trying to hold down a building in a windstorm? I just don't understand where a dog of three tons would make sense in the natural world. Do no, you I'm understand asking. what evolution is? Evolution oh, is do. trying to to exist in a way that works in nature. So where would a three ton dog, and next you're gonna say, can we get one the size of a flea? Where would these dogs fit in? Where would their niche be? And and what would be the advantage of a three ton, or was it three tons or 3000? I don't even know what you said there, Ken, but yeah, it, yeah, I think it's usually the size of Texas. But yeah, in this case, a three ton dog has no purpose. Well, I'm trying to get you to understand there are three ton animals on the planet, like elephants. Absolutely. And where are well, they? So it is possible for an animal to weigh three tons. But a Ken, where, weigh... where are these three ton uh, animals you're talking about? They're in the ocean. No, there's elephants. I okay. Elephants so you... get up to, they live on land. Okay. Three, I don't know if the number's right. Let's just pick a number and say it's probably up to 6,000 pounds. Okay. Certainly. They're huge. Absolutely. And there have been bigger animals than that. There have been brachiosaurs on, the, and we find the bones of them. They probably weighed a hundred tons. Right. So there are mammals and reptiles and land-dwelling animals that get up to a hundred tons. So I'm trying to get you to uh, see: is there a limit to dogs? With why can't they get a 700-pound dog? Don't ask me why. Do we need one? There are animals that weigh 700 pounds. There are animals that weigh three tons. There are animals that used to weigh a hundred tons. So is there a limit to dogs? Is there something in the dog gene code that says you can go from one pound to 270, but you can't go beyond? Is there a limit at all? Well, for example, you look at a dog, okay? So you're comparing a, a um, let's say we'll go back to the elephant. Uh, the elephant stands on its feet flat. So uh, an elephant has a completely different stand than what a dog does. A dog's a digigate. So it's up on its toes, it's standing. Um, where are you going to get to the point where those toes are going to hold up a three ton dog? Um, just like your 900 year old man, at a certain point, just the way a dog is put together, it's not going to work. It's going to start to fail. The, the structure is just not made to be a 3000 pound animal. And that's really all there is to it. It really is that simple, Kent, that foot that you're looking at there. If you look at that Great Dane, looking at that chihuahua or whatever kind of dog that is that is its heel that's six inches up its back that's why it has a dew claw there it is up on its its toes like a like a, a ballerina and it would not make sense that that dog would be able to hold much more weight than the, than the, the 300 pounds that we see as a maximum level for dogs well, two things. First of all, elephants do walk on their toes constantly. They have a large fat pad under their different, under their... different design, though. Completely yeah, different, different design. design. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold it. A different what? Design? It's a different design. Absolutely oh, different. a different design. Is that a slip of the tongue? It's not a design then. It's by chance, right? No, it's a design. Absolutely. It's a design. Nature elephants? designed okay. it. Yeah. Nature oh, I have design. no problems telling you design, Ken. I'll give you design all day long. It, nature okay. is a great designer of animals. It's It's been doing it for for uh, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, and it'll continue designing animals for us. Well, I'm, I'm sure you believe that. Um, well, so you said it's not going to work. It's going to fail if you get a dog up to a certain weight limit. So I'm going to try to interpret your answer for you to understand yourself. 
you're saying, and which I asked you at the beginning, is there a limit? And you are saying, yes, there is a limit to dog size. The way the dog is put together right now, yes, I would say there's a limit. Just like with man, there's a limit to the amount of age that we can live to. We cannot okay. live to 900 years. Impossible. Well, probably not today. Um, never. Uh, never. Okay. Never. But were there animals that got up to 100 tons like this guy? Uh, yes, absolutely. So the, there wasn't a limit for the 100 tons then. I mean. Have you seen the bones in their legs? Oh, yeah. I've got some re replicas of them here. They're huge. Absolutely. Right? So you got to think about what a dog did. Back in the day, a dog was a chaser. A dog had to be able to, to hunt down prey. Um, it had to be able to go out and run fast. There was no advantage for it to weigh that way. So the, the body was put together very streamlined. It's put together very athletically. I know you uh, continually put down small dogs as being useless, but they were even bred for a reason. They fit into small holes. They were able to go in. They were able to, uh, they were able to pull rabbits out of a hole. Um, it, dogs are a great example of, of evolution, um, Kent. Absolutely. One of the best examples examples we got. I, I would say the only thing that we even have close to the the um, proof for evolution beyond dogs would be the, the cat species. It, it's also very um, diverse if you look at what we've done with cats. Okay, do you think animal breeders uh, such as yourself will ever be able to get the dogs of any kind to produce something that would be considered a non-dog? Uh, to consider to be a non-dog, how much time do you got, Kent? Because it's happening right now. I just read a story this morning on things called sea wolves. Uh, yes, write that down, sea wolves. They're out in BC. They are spending up to 90% of their day in the water. They are getting 75% of their, their food out of the oceans. And they're able to swim up to, I believe it said seven and a half miles um, from island to island. And this is how they have found a spot in nature that had an opening and they're eking out a living doing exactly that. They are living in the ocean. Uh, their bodies are changing, their noses are changing, their ears are changing, their tails are getting shorter, their feet are getting more webbed. Um, and this they have been watching for the last 50 years. And that it was on a, um, a science um, uh, paper it went out today. I read it this morning. Okay. And they're calling it the sea wolf in, I, in, I will, uh, in BC. I will certainly, uh, it's uh, British Columbia finding it? British Columbia, Canada, okay. yes. So this is a sea wolf. Is it still considered in the dog family? Canine? Well, it's still considered in the dog family, but is the wolf in the dog family? Is the jackal in the dog family? Where are we going to draw the line? Because th this is this is the dishonesty of the young earth creationist view. You, you try to tell us what we say things are. And Kent, you know that we never say that a dog will produce a cat. You're not allowed to go back down the tree. And I want you to remember this in future debates. You are never allowed to go down the tree. You've got the roots, you got the trunk, you got the branches, you got the leaves, Kent. You can never have a leaf produce another leaf. It will only move forward from there. You cannot climb down the branch and up another branch and have a dog make a cat. That is absolutely impossible. So whatever the dog becomes in the future is what time will do to it. Look at how much it's changed in the last 10,000 years. That's how long we've been breeding dogs. We've done that in 10,000 years. I have 700 million years to produce what we have on earth right now. And that's all I need. I don't need 12 billion, never needed it. Okay, I, I'm, all, I'm okay. surprised no one's called you out on that before because we only need the 700 million that we've continually claimed. Look it up. That's when it really started to explode. That's when all the single cell turned into uh, the complex stuff that we have now. That's where it all started up. Well, I think we Not could argue 12 about billion you. years. I don't think you can get 700 million either. I could go through geophysical reasons why that's not possible. I can't think of one. Slowing and, yeah, slowing its spin. Anyway. So you're What's never the earth slowing its spin have to do with anything, Ken? Yeah, it puts a time limit on how, low, how old the earth can be. The earth is slowing down. How much is it slowing down, though? About a thousandth of a second per day. So where's our where's our problem? For one thing, it's not linear. We know that. I've talked to you. I've right. heard you it talk about it. It makes it worse when it's, when it's geometric. It makes it much worse, logarithmic. Why is that? 
Well, any like spinning we, we know how we know how old the universe is. So there's something wrong with your your view, Kent. That's all that we can no. say about it. So we don't you're know. the one that has to tell us why we're wrong, that it's not uh, almost 13 or 14 billion years old, this uh, this universe and why why the Earth uh, isn't 4.54 and why the sun isn't five or six billion years old. You got to tell us why you just can't say that uh, because it, it's slowing down X and that's just impossible. Well, there is another, nothing another... we see in nature that that would give us a time limit that I've ever known about or ever looked into. And if you can tell me one, I'd be shocked. Okay, well, my video number one covers about 50 of the scientific limits on the age of the Earth or the universe, but that's not the topic of this debate. So did uh, the, all the dogs in the world, you said they, they're always going to be dog, which is what I've said over and over. And the, I, I believe probably the dog, the wolf, and the coyote are the, in the same family and probably had a common ancestor on Noah's Ark. But... I do not believe the dog is related to the amoeba or the banana or the whale, but you do. If oh, we absolutely. Went back, okay. So if we start with a single cell creature, let's say it's an amoeba, did the amoeba eventually become a non-amoeba? Did it eventually like evolve to try to figure out a way to live on whatever substance it could find and uh, eco to living? Absolutely. Ken, what you don't realize, and, and I've heard you talk about this a lot, and a really good example is, is take, for example, the cheetah. The cheetah is running right around the, the uh, 50 mile an hour area. So you've got cheetahs running at 50. We have the elk running at approximately 51 miles an hour. Well, not only are the cheetahs trying to get faster and the elk trying to get faster, but in the background, you've also got another group of elk that are getting shorter and they're able to make a living and live by hiding in the grass. You've also got elk that are changing color and they're being successful that way. There's not just one route that an animal or a species will take to try to make a living, to try to find a way to live. So it will not just be a balance where, you know, a cat will get up to 51 miles an hour, the elk will get up to 52, so the 52 mile an hour elk will live. It, it, there's so much more going on in nature. Nature always tries to find a way, and that's where you end up with the different species. You don't just end up with one. So you will get one that's trying to run faster and faster, but you'll also get a, a species that's trying to get shorter and shorter, slower and slower, and its, its life is dependent on it being able to hide in the grass and just not getting pegged off as much by the, um, by the cheetahs. Well, instead of the cheetah slowly learning to run faster to catch the elk, why doesn't the cheetah learn to eat grass? The elk eats grass and grass can't run very fast at all. They wouldn't because have to run at all, just eat the incredibly grass. Incredibly inefficient food source. Do you, have you ever the watched the cow? On it. Elks are lots bigger than a cheetah and they live and on And you know plants. what it does all day long? It eats all day, Kent. You watch a it horse, it barely sleeps. Yeah, it may do fine, but Kent, that's something. Why don't you eat grass? you will have to stand out in a field all day and eat grass to get enough of what you need and you will never get enough um meat eaters are meat eaters period we need the proteins we need the uh we need right. the, the vitamins we need the minerals we need meat that's all there is to it that's how we know that animals have always ate meat there's no way that they were ever vegetarians that that's just not even a possibility well, now hold it would you would you agree that elephants are pretty big and they live on vegetation and that's all they do all day can't they eat that that's bad? all they do they eat and they move slow so you got to decide what you're going to do if you want to drive around in a in a, uh, a dodge k car going two miles an hour guess what you don't have to put very much gas in it if you want to be an active uh lion tiger anything that moves at a reasonable speed and doesn't want to spend its whole day eating uh you better figure out a food source that has a hell of a lot more protein in it and a way to um to get that protein fast eat get it done and get on with life well, there are some huge animals in the sea and on land, like really huge, that live on pure plant life. That's so all they do, Ken. That What's is that? all they do. That is all they do. They eat. They, that is their life. Is Watch a horse. I think uh, elephants can run pretty fast, and I don't think that's all they do. There are baby elephants out there, you know. They must be doing something somewhere. They so, eat. That's it. I'm not a word that's of a lie. I'm not making this up, Kent. <laughs> they really do. Horses eat all day. Cows eat all day. It's a very inefficient way to eat. It's a very inefficient way to get to get the food that you need. 
And uh, so guess what? The lions, us, all the smarter animals, we'll let those guys go out there. We'll let them eat all day. And then we'll eat them and get all the advantage of the the thousands and thousands of hours of eating that they did to get that body mass up, get the protein and the, the minerals and vitamins into their body. And then we'll eat them in five minutes and get on with our day. And that is really honestly it. Right now, you're aware of the lion that was named Little Tyke they used in movies quite a bit that never would eat meat, refused to eat meat, lived on plants. How long did it live? Uh, finally got killed in a movie accident, I think. A full-grown lion, African lion. Just type in uh, Little Tyke, T-Y-K-E. There's an article on creation.com about it. It's been studied intently. They said this, it refused to eat any kind of meat or even blood. They tried as a baby to give it a little bit of blood in the milk. Wouldn't take it. Grew to be huge. I think 11 feet long. But that's not the point. Elephants are bigger than that. Okay, so all the elephants and all the tigers and all the cheetahs were in a dot that exploded. And over millions of years, somewhere along the line, because I say dogs produce dogs, and you guys get mad at me for saying that, but it's the obvious truth. But somewhere, if you go backwards in time, if you run the clock backwards, when was the dog a non-dog? Where's the 95? Huh? When it was a wolf. Okay, let's put dog, wolf, coyote in the same group. When was that, that family not in the dog category or wolf category. Where's the 95% Well, Ken, dog or pull wolf? Up, pull up the pictures of your dog again and show me a 100% dog. Which one's 100%? Which one's 95? They're all oh. changing. They're all becoming different dogs. Which one's 100% a dog? I'd say I know you don't think those, a, I don't I know you don't dog. think a child's 100% dog because you think it's useless. So tell me where where i know you don't like little dogs so there you go you tell me right there that that's not a hundred percent dog and i bet you think that great dane's a hundred percent dog what is a hundred percent of anything what is a hundred percent of a primate uh monkeys are a hundred percent primate and so are we uh i i really don't know where you're going with this uh, okay. to, to try to put these uh, abstract numbers onto something and say something that can be a hundred percent this or a hundred percent that it's, it's really not the way that it works. Um, obviously, a dog is a dog. We're looking at two dogs here. They have every single thing that each dog has. They both right. have. It doesn't matter their size. So I'm not, again, sure what you're getting at. Well, I agree. They're both 100% dog. I do think probably useless, but that's just a joke mostly, okay? But they are actually technically interfertile. Might be a few mechanical problems, but uh, the Chihuahua could impregnate the Great Dane if she cooperated, or the other way around, might kill the Chihuahua, but they have the same number of chromosomes, they're still dog, and I think everybody would agree that nearly all of the dog varieties we have in the world today probably did not exist 500 years ago. They were created for man's pleasure, either for hunting or, or lap dogs or something like that, or guard dogs. A, select, a trait was selected that was already in the gene code. It's already in the gene code to have dogs have sensitive smell. So they would focus on that to get tracking bloodhounds, okay? They're still a dog. They didn't, they didn't create a Geiger counter in the thing. It still only has a sense of smell, but they focused by selective breeding, selected a dog with a better sense of smell. I can understand. But th there are limits to this. This is what you guys refuse to admit. There are limits to the size of the dog. There are limits to the age a dog's going to live. There are limits to the sensitivity of its smell. Let's say, I don't know what the numbers are, but let's say a bloodhound can smell one molecule per 20,000, okay? Okay, there's probably the limit. I don't think they're gonna get much better than that. Uh, maybe you can get a dog like a greyhound that can run, say, 45 miles an hour, okay? Could they get one to run 200 miles an hour? There are animals like the hawk that can go 200 miles an hour. Why don't it, why don't it a dog to go 200? Well, in a dive, but uh, okay. So, so here we go again. So, I guess what you're saying is that uh, we never see anything. We we don't see things getting more complex. We see them getting simpler. Is that what you're basically getting at here? No, is I'm that... saying we, we don't see them getting new information. New information. Dog, okay. So, so, so here we go, Ken. If that was the case, you know what we'd be doing? We'd all be walking wolves down the street. So why are, aren't we using wolves to track? Why aren't we using wolves to sniff things out? Why aren't we using wolves to go out? And uh, if, if there's no new information, if these dogs that are known as sniffing dogs, why aren't we using wolves? Why didn't we just well, breed them once for friendliness and just use a wolf for everything? And by the way, a wolf can only run at about 20 miles an hour. So a greyhound sure. has it by almost two and a half times. Right, question. 
Greyhound has it by two and a half times. That has been selectively bred for speed. If you turned all the greyhounds in the world loose into the woods, would they survive? Would we? Would the greyhounds survive in the wild, or do they have to be babysat by a human to keep them alive? Four Not minutes. Dog. Four minutes until Q and A. Okay. So would we would, can? Would that, we? I I, I want to go so far beyond this. Let Let's give up on dogs, Ken. You're loose. We're taking you to South America. We're throwing you in the bush. Are you going to survive? No, not very long. Exactly. So I, I really don't understand what, what this is, what you're getting at, because monkeys do just fine in the bush. We don't. We have evolved to the point where we are, where we had to learn how to um, build fires. We had to learn how to build clothes. We had to learn how to build tools. Uh, we evolved to the point where we can no longer actually just go live in a bush and that's the other thing i always hear creationists talk that man is this refined um species we don't look like a monkey what do you think would happen kent if uh, your wife decided to stop shaving her armpits her legs and you stop shaving and let your hair grow we are not the way we look we are apes and if we left our hair alone and if we didn't cut it just like apes don't cut their hair we're not it's not that hard to see us as an ape the only thing that makes it hard is because yeah we get dressed up we cut our hair we shave we do these things but man is not as um evolved it, it, actually if you want to go into the, the the word evolution we've pretty much got ourselves to the point where we are a useless animal if if we weren't living the way we live we would not do well in nature at all anymore we would do terribly well are there people in the bush who do just fine and can survive in the bush yeah are they there, don't have very good lives though do they but there there are humans who i don't think a wolf has a very good life either he's got to chase food all day long but, but that's not me and you. That is not me and you. I'm telling you, Kent, if I go down to Florida and drink water, I get sick off of it. That's how weak we've made ourselves. These bush people are completely different. I think you'll agree. They got stronger immune systems. Uh, they're continually exposed to things that we're not exposed to. And uh, yeah, don't go to Mexico and drink the water, but the people in Mexico can drink it just fine. When I say that right. when, when we look at ourselves, I'm talking about, you know, first world countries. Uh, people like me and you that have become so uh, delicate when it comes to temperature, we've become delicate when it comes to food. Um, you know, man back in the day used to eat raw food. Well, there are people who can live in the bush. You're right. We've been we've become very soft and we would still be interfertile with those people in the bush. We would still we be the same, still be the same kind. It's called mankind. Right. We are not interfertile with apes of any kind. Stalin How tried know that. that? To what? How do we know that? Stalin tried to breed super warriors by getting no. Humans that's in. that's not true. That that's very that's very hearsay. We don't know what really happened there. And uh, yeah, I'd be careful saying that it can't be done because genetically we're very close to the bonobo. We have lots of apes that are very close, and uh, genetic science says that there are some that that we could possibly um, take. But that's that's not even somewhere that I want to go. That's a very risque topic. And I don't think we want to go down that road. But uh, believe okay, me, I, I would I'll... not be surprised if, if if on paper, they figure out that we can breed with we're very close to uh, to some of the ape species. Kent. We're very well, close. First of all, I, I, will, I will go on record as saying it is not possible for the okay. apes and the humans to interbreed. Secondly, there are differences between apes and humans. We have more than just a body. We have some. We have a consciousness of life way beyond what the apes have. We have a so consciousness do, uh, of So do elephants. Life. So do elephants. They go back and visit their dead. Well, you wanted to have a moment of silence for Bill Ludlow, who I debated. Absolutely. Why? Why? Out of Why? respect. It gave well, me time dead, to reflect. If, hey, if he's dead, he's gone. What difference? He's, he's nothing no. but rotting meat now. No, absolutely not. Bill's left a long, uh, uh, behind a, a great legacy. Bill has done a lot of great things for science. Bill was a very passionate man about teaching children um, about the natural world around us and what's going on. Bill, Bill was a great man. I was not praying to a God, Kent. I was giving him, like I said when I came on, I said, it's funny, what popped into my head was the debate between you and Bill, Bill Ludlow. It, it wasn't a religious moment for me. It was a moment where I could reflect on what Bill has done and uh yeah that's you know that's why i wanted that that's why i wanted a, a moment of silence for bill just to be able to uh to reflect on his life and i think he had a very uh a, a very good life very prosperous life and i think he did a lot of great things 
Well, he may have. He also did an enormous amount of damage by teaching children that you're just an animal and evolution is true. He taught a lot How's of that lies. damaging? How does that damage anything? It's not true. You're not just an animal. You can't just say that. And yes, we are animals. In every sense of the word animal, we are an animal. We, we, you start checking off the boxes for animal, we're every single one of them. Ken, okay, we have do... every single body system. We have every bone. We have, at right. what point do we not become animals? Like I said, you don't shave. Don't shave your legs as a woman. Don't shave your armpits. We would very much start looking like animals. That, that We would start to look like our ape cousins. We really would. I haven't shaved my legs ever. Well, we, I hopefully your wife has. With, unless you live in Canada. That's what we do up here to stay warm. They don't look too bad. All right. With that. Much different than that's, anyway, we've got, we've I honestly, uh, James, I, fe I feel like I only touched 1% of the things that I, I got papers everywhere on things that I wanted to go over with, with Kent. So I'm really hey. hoping that he'll indulge in um, in moving this forward, if that's what your uh, let's, audience Let's do another one. But why don't you come down to Lennox at 70 we, degrees down here? You know we are, Kent. I already told my wife that I'd bring you, uh, that I'd bring her down to meet you, and uh, we'd we'd tour around your little uh, your little compound there. It's not a compound, and it's not little. It's 140 acres, and it's a science center. Go yeah, ahead. Kent. We're in Canada. Our provinces make uh, make Texas look like uh, yeah. We we don't even we don't talk big when we're talking states. Ontario's twice the size of Texas, so you're right, a little hundred about ten about ten percent of the people. <laughs> But I, I'd love to talk to you more, Kent. Uh, sure. Yeah, and we will be coming down to see you. And I, I'd, yeah, okay. So we, we can get on with the question and answer period here and uh, see what they got for us. Excellent. Very excited to read these questions. So we appreciate all of your questions, folks. Starting off with the super chats, we appreciate it. Frank uh, Frank's ninety two. Thanks for your super chat. He said, "Rest in peace, Bill Ludlow." Well, we agree with you there, and. For those of you who haven't heard, I saw some people in the live chat. Sorry, I usually feel like social media is not a good way to find out. You know, ideally it can be somebody you know and in person. But uh, if you haven't heard, uh, Bill Ludlow has passed away. So we are, you know, we hope his family knows that we, our hearts go out to them. That's really hard. And as well as his friends, we hope they know that our, our hearts go out to them. So Taz. This looks like a, a new gentleman or lady. Uh, Tez Stickle, thanks for your super chat. They said, Kent, can you demonstrate to us that you understand what evolutionists mean when they say we, quote, share a common ancestor with other primates? Sure, I can demonstrate very clearly. That shows that they have enormous faith way beyond the scientific observation the scientific observation, which is what science is supposed to be, observable, testable, demonstrable, is that apes produce apes, chimpanzees produce chimpanzees, monkeys produce monkeys, orangutans produce orangutans. They don't mate with each other. They certainly don't mate with humans. We are a different kind. It's actually called mankind. We are very different. We're not part of the ape family. Though I taught school 15 years, I had a few students that made me wonder a few times. But no, they're not interfertile. We are not, same, not the same number of chromosomes. And the length of the chromosomes is different. There are millions of differences between humans and all of the apes. You want to look for similarities, I suppose you can. If you want to be related to them, you can. You can pretend that you are. But science deals with things we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. All the observation says humans produce more humans and apes produce more apes. They don't crossbreed. Monkeys, we had, I used to raise squirrel monkeys. They don't produce anything but squirrel monkeys. That's it. End of story. So if you wish to believe that long ago and far away we diverged from a common ancestor, you're welcome to believe that, but that's part of a religion that is not part of science at all. I understand real well what they think they know, okay? Gotcha. James, give me two seconds there, and if you take uh, what Kent's saying about um, uh, just look into our, our fused genes, that's all you got to do, and it's pretty much the nail in the coffin when you've got a... Uh, uh, telomeres in the center and centromeres on the end. We we know exactly what's going on. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Google it, and you'll see. shows shows our ancestry from ape, and it's 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 it really is the last nail in the coffin for it. Gotcha. Thanks for your uh, your responses. I hate cutting you off. Just to be sure we don't go down a rabbit hole, we got a lot of questions, so we'll keep them short and pithy. Gosh, Stephen Steen, you're you're sick. He's our friendly, benevolent troll. If you haven't met Stephen, he says Mark thinks he's an expert animal tamer. 
but there's no way to tame this stunning stallion and majestic beast that is James. Well, that's very sweet. Thank you. Mothra, <laughs> Mothra J. Disco, thanks for your super chat. Uh, they said, Kent, will you debate Robert Beatty on structuring because you've been avoiding it for years now, or are you... Oh, I think it's... Oh, they had a emoticon of a chicken. Uh, and then they said, rest in peace, Bill. <laughs> they said, rest in, in power, Bill Ludlow. I don't know if there's a... But anyway, so rest in peace, Bill Ludlow and uh, Kent. They I don't know who Robert Beatty is, but I guess that it's a person that wants Robert a piece of Beatty, you. Robert Beatty is a former IRS agent that they called out just to hassle me. He had three, three followers until he started picking on Kent Hovind. He jumped up to 80 followers. He is a legend in his own mind. I know I, I won't debate him on structuring. Stru this is un unrelated to anything about creation evolution. I did not break the structuring law. There's a long, the whole website, KentHovenIsInnocent.com. Video number three goes for an hour and a half from a paralegal on that topic. I did not break any structuring laws, and I, but they did give me 10 years in prison for it, and we're still going to fight that until I die. We're going to win. No, I wouldn't I wouldn't give Robert Beatty the time of day. He's not interested in truth at all. Robert, go away. <laughs> Gosh, <yeah>, okay. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Roy Lindsay, thanks for your super chat. Uh, he says, every Kent debate turns into the other debater teaching Kent basic science. I believe Kent has no interest in truth and is intentionally dishonest. Oh, snap. Kent, you have a chance to respond to that. <laughs> well, what basic science, I think I understand basic science really well. What is there to observe? Science deals with observations. Okay. Would your friend, who, uh, whoever did this question, would they like to have a debate with me? Call 855-BIG-DINO, extension 2, that's Rhonda, the secretary, and schedule it. I'll be glad to, I'll debate anybody on the topic of creation evolution. It, it's, it's not science. It's a poison mixed in with our science books, but it's not science. Nothing scientific about it. Nobody's ever seen any animal produce a different kind of animal. They imagined that it happened long ago and far away, but what do you mean teaching me basic science? What would he like to, what would he like to, to teach me? Tell him, go ahead, schedule a debate. We'll take him on next. James, get his number. You call him. You do post, host most of the debates here, so have another one tomorrow. You can. If I could just touch on that, what I would like to do, Ken, is I'd like you to learn the word of what science even means, because uh, Darwin's um, theory of evolution has been considered one of the most enlightening um, things that man has figured out. I, I forget the exact words that they use, but he, his realization of what we got going on here with the divergence of animals is considered one of the biggest scientific discoveries of all time. So if that's not science, I don't know what is. I'm sure you, then I'm sure you don't know what is, because that is not science. Well, Darwin that, never I'm just telling you what, he, what he's considered. His, his okay. insight into the uh, evolution of man and uh, animals was considered right. one of the I would, uh, consider Darwin biggest... a, I would consider Darwin a moron. He no, thought no. all animals had a common ancestor. That is simply not true. I would say probably all the dogs have a common ancestor, a dog or a dog or wolf-like animal. That is not proof that dogs and mosquitoes are related. Yes, yeah, I do they are. That, that's part two. Well, you can one believe second. that if you want. But the word science comes from the Greek word, Latin word, seer, which means to know. What do we know? We know that dogs produce dogs. We do, not no. know that dogs. we do not know that dogs and mosquitoes are related. We absolutely do. It's me. called you genetics. Can believe that if you want. Just to kind genetics. of keep us moving through. So absolutely, sorry James. So keep them rolling. We have absolutely. Oh, that. Okay. We've got Mothra J. Disco. I, it looks like they... We've got Roy Lindsay. You heard it. Kent has offered a debate, uh, he, he, a challenge to debate. Mothra J. Disco, I have a feeling you might get a challenge as well. Mothra J. Disco, he's he's coming at you, Kent. He says, Kent, you don't understand evolution. Be honest. I completely understand what they teach. I don't believe it. Evolution is the dumbest and most dangerous religion ever invented in the history of humanity. Nobody's ever seen any t animal produce a different kind of animal. All we've ever seen are cows produce cows, dogs produce dogs. There are no exceptions. No farmer in the history of the world or clear across anywhere on the world will tell you they've ever seen anything different. Now, if you wish to imagine SpongeBob style that dogs and bananas and wolves are related, you're welcome to imagine all you want, but that's not science. Science deals with things we can observe, study and test and demonstrate. All observations show us, sure, you can get a lot of varieties like Great Dane and Chihuahua, but they're still dogs. And there's a limit. You're never going to get a dog as small as a flea or a dog as big as uh, Texas. 
there are limits. There are limits to the sense of smell. There are limits to the speed. There are limits to the bone structure. There, but there are animals as small as a flea, like a flea. So it is possible, and there are animals as big as an elephant. I completely understand what evolution teaches. I don't believe it for one second. I think it's the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the world. Gotcha. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Fifth Element, thanks for your super chat. They said, Kent, explain why Planck time is important. And I, if I, hopefully I'm spelling or pronouncing it right. I think it's after Planck, maybe not. Uh, yeah, I think Planck. Planck. That's right. Yeah, Planck, Planck time. Yeah. And they say depends where you are, but it's Planck. Yep, you're okay with that. And they say, and please do so in detail without one of your typical. <laughs> oh, they're coming at you, Kent. They said without one of your typical ridiculous comments. So Kent, uh, you can give a chance a response to that. Are are they asking for why we need billions of years? I think we could show that there's lots of limits to say the universe cannot be billions of years old. We certainly can show that there's no evidence of any animal of any matter creating itself out of nothing. So where'd all this matter come from? There's a whole lot of matter in the universe. I think the idea that that was all squeezed in a dot is extremely stupid, but if you wish to believe that, that's fine. But I would resent paying for that to be taught in science as a science class. That's part of a religion class, long ago and far away, boys and girls. It's, it's fairy tale stuff. So I guess have them refine the question. Are they, are they asking, do we, how would I explain billions of years? It doesn't exist doesn't exist so anyways plonk time plonk frequency plonk anything is the point in which the mathematics start to break down uh we cannot go any further than that with math and it is just the point where the mathematics start to break down and we start to get uh numbers that don't make sense and that is where we're fitting god in so um kent your your proper answer would have been that that is where i can fit god in is uh in this oh, no, no. Uh, this, this moment no the, that, that is where you are fitting evolution in not at all okay Wait, one sec so sorry just before we go on another rage part pro. two rage pro that's right if you guys want to come back we'd be happy to have you both you guys have both been really pleasant so rage pro thanks for your super chat he's coming at you kent he says does your worldview recognize bears are related to dogs does my worldview recognize bear? No, bears are, it depends what you mean by rec related. Are, do, do they both have hair? Well, yeah. Uh, do they both have, you know, two eyes? Sure. But there's obviously bears and dogs are not interfertile. I think anybody would study these animals will tell you bears are a different variety than dogs or different. Uh, so no, I don't think bears and dogs are related. I think all animals and all plants were created by the same creator. Is the Chevy van and the Chevy pickup truck related? They're both made by Chevy. How do, define the word related. What do you mean related? No, bears always produce bears without exception. Dogs always produce dogs without exception. We've never seen, we cannot prove that bears and dogs have a common ancestor. He's welcome to believe that if he'd like, but that would be a religious belief, not scientifically observable. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Next, uh, Sidrophanos Rabia is in the house. Good to see you. They had a super chat. Thanks for that. They said, you know, I can never tell if Sigifredo is trolling me or not. Sometimes it's hard to understand. I th he says, how did chicken evolve to be so delicious and what features aided this predator in survival? What about a fainting goat or magic carp? I think that, I think he's being for real part, it's a little mix of trolling, but I think he means like fainting goat. Like, why would that be adaptive? Like, why would that be a successful strategy for it's a genetic it. recession it's it's not something that is successful it's it's a it's a problem it's just like uh with human beings when we have epilepsy it is it's a problem it's a recessive gene and unfortunately because we did not have a creator nature took over um we have a very imperfect uh replication system that sometimes makes mistakes and uh exactly that you get fainting goats you get um you get problems you get people with epilepsy you get uh people with these different problems that are you know because things did not replicate properly as far as why is the chicken taste so good i have no idea but they do taste good i'll give them that but i myself would have went with beef gotcha really quick uh we've got a few more thanks so much subtracted for your super chat they said kent why do you why do humans and chimps share the fox p2 gene I would say they have the same designer. Why do Chevy Fords and Chevy, uh, Chevy Vans and Chevy trucks have the same lug nuts fit on both of them? Aha, uh -huh. proof they evolved from a skateboard. 
gotcha. No. The same designer, Megan. I think God used the same design basic pattern. Number one, we have you know the basic proteins in all the different animals, 20 different amino acids in the proteins as a general rule. And so that we could eat each other, we could eat, we can eat the, uh, the cow can eat the green grass and make the uh, make, yeah, milk yeah, yeah. and I can churn it, make the yellow butter and get it, get the blonde hair. So blonde the hair. fact that we have the similar gene structure or similar similarities would not be proof of common ancestor, but proof of common designer. However, let me point this one point out. I'm not demanding that everybody pay for my thinking about the di designer to be taught in the school. You guys are demanding that we all pay for your religion to be taught in the schools and with exclusivity. We're not allowed to teach the kids. Might be a creator. Oh, you can't do that. But it's okay to teach them to evolve. It's a religion. I think it's absolutely evil that they're doing that. Think I'm so. always really, I'm always really quick, James. I'll tell you one thing. I'm 51 years old, and as a child, I, I said the Lord's Prayer every morning in school. We spent far, far more time reciting the Lord's Prayer in the morning than we ever spent on evolution. I think it was probably about three or four days. So I'm not sure where all this money's going or tax money or this or that. But uh, yeah, I spent more time praying um, in the morning, the Lord's Prayer. Gotcha. Thanks for your, uh, both that question as well as your guys' responses. Raphael Block, thanks for your super chat. He said, Kent, would you please steel man plant and animal definitions and then list the features that differentiate humans from animals under that, uh, you could say, taxonomy of kind of the secular or evolution definitions of plant and animal. Okay, I think everybody that teaches or learns studies biology would agree there is a plant kingdom and there is an animal kingdom and they're different. Now, there's a few screwball ones at the microscopic level that get pretty hard to classify. But as a general rule, they can be classified in the plant kingdom or animal kingdom. I use the illustration of our tool bench downstairs, our tool in the shop here. We can classify tools. Is it a screwdriver or a hammer or a wire cutter? Well, it's, most of them are easy to classify. There's a few that are hard to classify. Like, where are we going to put this? Is this considered a hammer? Because, you know, the fencing pliers it's got a hammer on it. I don't know. But I think 99.99% of all the living organisms can be easily classified into plant or animal kingdom. Now, plants, uh, uh, the best definition I've ever heard, plants have a body, they grow, they reproduce, they replicate, but animals have something different than plants. Animals have a consciousness of life that as far as we know, plants do not have. A conscious, they're, they're not only alive, they know they're alive. Something's different between the animal and plant kingdom. Then there's man, which is not only has a, lot, a body, like plants do and animals do, we have a consciousness of life and we have a consciousness of an afterlife. We have a consciousness of God that no other creature seems to have. There's something different. Call it body, soul, and spirit, if you'd like. We, plants only have a body. Animals have a body and a soul, a spirit. Man has a body, soul, and spirit. We have certainly something different between man and the animals. Now, if you wish to believe there's no difference. You can believe whatever you want. But I think everybody with one eye and half a brain would tell you there's something different between man and animals. Here we are worried about Bill Ludlow dying. Do you think any of the animals ever go around worried about somebody that died? You talk about Absolutely. the elephants going back to the grave. Absolutely. Are there any other animals besides the elephant going back to the grave? Don uh, dolphins, too, more than their dad. Oh, dolphins. Okay. Yeah. And not only that, the only difference between uh, man and animals, because man is obviously an animal, is we have one hell of an imagination. So that's the only difference is we have an imagination. You don't think elephants have an no imagination? There is no difference. We are an animal, but we have one heck of an imagination. We can make up stories, good stories, big stories. Oh, Darwin made Darwin made up a huge one, didn't he? Wow, <laughs> what a story. Gotcha. Thanks so much for those responses as well as Fifth Element. Thanks for your super chat. They said, uh, what does Planck time have to do with millions of years? What is Planck time? Kent, and can you answer without your ridiculous comments? Are you like <laughs> them apples? Okay, go ahead, Ken. Well, I'm sure anybody who believes they came from a rock thinks my comments are ridiculous. Okay, you can believe what you want. Well, as, as uh, he said tonight, as Mark said, this is where the numbers begin to break down. The math breaks down. This is where you enter into fairy tale imagination land. When the numbers, when reality breaks down, you're in fairy tale land, okay? And this evolution with the millions of years and animals turning from, from non-living material to living material, it's all imagination land. It's not just the numbers breaking down, it's reality breaking down. It didn't happen. They can dream it happened. They can think it happened if they like. But uh, that's not science. 
science. Science is limited to what we can observe, study, and test. Science cannot deal with many different things. Gotcha. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, disciplines outside the film of, uh, field of science. So I think uh, the answer Mark gave that uh, Planck time is where Planck time is where things break down. The mathematics breaks down. That sounds like a reasonable explanation, but it really got to admit this is where you're going into fairy tale, no longer science. Gotcha. Next up, last one. Thanks for your super chat. So this is she goes by this. This is her own name. Self oh, I know what it's gonna be. Stupid whore energy. Yeah. Says, <laughs> given she says, given that two proteins don't need to have the same amino acid sequence to have the same function. Doesn't the similarity make more sense in light of common descent? So I think this is referring back to the question on why is it that humans and I think it was maybe apes share the FOX2 gene? Is that question for me? Yes. Well, our English language has 26 letters. You can rearrange those letters and make an infinite number of words, apparently, okay? Certainly an infinite number of sentences. It would be limitless how many sentences, different sentences could be made. By just changing one or two letters, you can radically change the meaning of the sentence. George went and stole the money from the bank. It would be an example. I could say, John went and stole the money from the bank. Well, that's many, many similarities in the sentence sequence, but a vastly different meaning. Like the word uh, the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, contains every letter of the English alphabet. You can, re you can rearrange those 26 letters and make totally different words and different meanings, or make most of them, if you just simply drop those letters from that sentence on the table, 99.99999% of the time, it would make nothing, wouldn't make a sentence at all. So the amino acids, the 20 different amino acids found in proteins, you can be arranged different ways and make different proteins. I agree. What does that prove? Somebody's arranging them. There's a designer to make all the proteins. And we can eat the meat from the cow and develop and, put, and digest it into our system. But the cow ate the grass to get it into his meat. And the grass ate the dirt to turn it into grass. <laughs> it, it, it's an amazing design, the cycle of nature that God designed. And I'm going to give God the glory for what he did. I think it's amazing. I love studying it. Taught biology for years. I love studying the bio ology study of life life is amazing very different than non-life and it's fun to study come on down to our science center and we'll give you a tour and let you learn about real science god made everything Kent, i can't um, i can't imagine what that class was like where you taught bio biology i i i can't even for a minute imagine what you I'm taught sure you can i'm sure you can. pretty much everything that you, you talk can. about when it comes to biology is I, I don't I don't even know what you could have taught. I really don't. I would love to have another debate with you and hear some of this stuff because okay. uh, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you don't both. Say. We do have one question that just came in. Uh so thanks Mark for your patience. That I think every single question was for Kent so far. Mark, one person just fired it in. Pence Pants L. Jones, thanks for your super chat. They said, Mark, which features did not develop by evolution? Uh what car didn't fly? I, I I don't know what that means, James. You gotta you gotta Kent. Can you help me out on that? Because everything is through evolution. Um, yeah, I I'm I not can, sure I, what he's asking. Mark, I can definitely help you out. You can nothing, help me on this one. Nothing, nothing is through evolution. Everything was designed. It was designed to have make variations available. Some people are taller or shorter, but there's variations within the created kind. There are people seven feet tall. There is nobody four hundred feet tall. There are people. 40 inches tall, but there's nobody one inch tall. God designed every feature and gave it limits, uh, gave it variations that can happen. And the variations are fun, fun to explore. That's biology, the study of life. Love it. All the 140, all the 140 foot tall people got hit by the moon. Next ah. up, we want to say thanks so much. We've already gone over uh, Kent's time once again. I'm so sorry about that. Kent usually asks for like a maybe an hour, a little over an hour. And we've honestly, I'm so sorry, Kent, that we have like uh gone over that uh but want to say thank you to our speakers we appreciate them it's been a pleasure to have both of them i think this has been yeah it was i really honestly i think that the audience loved it as well uh we have like had a huge audience tonight that seems to be very lively so we really i i know that i totally enjoyed it so thank you guys so much for being here we appreciate you spending your time 
And with that, want to let you know one more time, their links are in the description. So you can actually hear more. If you enjoyed that, there's plenty more where that came from. So we appreciate both of our speakers and want to let you know out there, thanks for being here. and Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Take care, everybody. Hey, everybody. Today, we are debating the flood of Noah, and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for this epic debate as we have these two seasoned veterans. We are thrilled to have them here as they debate for the... Not the first time they debated. This is round two, folks, but a new topic, brand new topic. It is the Flood of Noah tonight, and we are thrilled to let you know as well that their links are in the description. So if you enjoy what you hear from these two gentlemen, want to let you know there is plenty more that you can hear at their links below. And also want to let you know... If this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button if you want reminders for future debates that we have coming up, as we are very excited about those as well. And don't forget to hit that little notification bell for those reminders. So with that, gentlemen, saying I'm excited is an understatement. Thank you very much, both of you, for being here. I'm going to just quick let people know what the format is, and then we'll jump right into it. So for that... Want to let you know there will be about 10 minutes opening statements or less if the debaters would like to take less, followed by open discussion for uh, maybe about 45 minutes and then four minute closings, followed by a brief session of Q&A. We've got a short and sweet one tonight. But with that, I'm going to kick it over to Mark Drisdale, who has agreed to start first. And with that, once again, thanks, gentlemen, for being here. Thanks a lot, James. Thanks for hosting this again. This is a great channel. I really enjoy uh, debating on this channel, and I really de I enjoy uh, uh, interacting with uh, Dr. Holman. I I really do. We had a little bit of a scare with Kent today. Uh, he I guess had a little bit of a hospital visit, and um, from all the atheists, we would like to say uh, we're glad you're okay, Kent. We don't know what we would do without you. So again, we're we're very happy that you made it through whatever your situation was. I don't want to give out personal information but I know you came out of it well and I also know Kent's going to be tired tonight apparently he went in at about five o'clock in the morning and uh, he's going to be doing this on very little sleep so we're going to take it easy on Kent tonight um, again I'm going to be uh, representing the true side the reality side of the flood that it never existed um, that we have plenty of proof that it never existed and there's absolutely no uh, geography there is no physics that would allow for the flood um, it basically it is a fairy tale it, at best it was a analogy that was to teach us a story about sin and uh that there is um there's consequences for sin um you know there's a lot in the bible that we can uh we can look to to uh um to find inspiration but uh definitely for me um looking at the flood as a as a literal um, happening is um, something that is obviously just not acceptable and, and there's really no uh, no physics that would allow for it. I know that Ken's going to talk about that a lot of the uh, water did not come from the sky, that it came from the waters uh, within. I'm going to explain to you why that is absolutely impossible. I hope that we touch a little bit on Noah's Ark. I would like to explain why that is an impossibility. Um, there's lots of things that we can go into here and one thing that I do really appreciate about Kent is that he doesn't, uh, he says he doesn't like the Gish Gallop, that he likes more of a back and forth um, than he does speeches. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kent and really shorten up my opening statement because I like the back and forth with Kent. I, I really like his energy and I know I'm not going to be making friends in the atheist world by saying it, but uh, I, I really like what Kent does and I like his passion for his beliefs. Um, and I'm one of the few people that honestly believe that Kent, Kent believes what he says. Um, I really do. So let's pass it over to Kent. Let him do his opening statement. And then let, let's get in some, to some back and forth. You don't want to hear Mark Drysdale's speech. You want to hear me do some back and forth with Kent and some uh, debunking of his, um, of his fairy tale book. Let her, let her take her away, Kent. Wow. Debunking of the fairy tale book. Well, I appreciate that. I think we can handle that. And I'm, you're, gonna, you're my next convert. You watch, Mark. I'm going to get you independent Baptist before it's over. You'll be baptized in our lake and you'll be an evangelist teaching on creation. 
Anyways, thank you for doing this again. Okay, uh, my name's Kent Hovind. I taught high school science and math 15 years, moved to Pensacola in 89, and now up in Lenox, Alabama, straight north 70 miles, where we're building dinosaur adventure land. The Bible warned us about people like Mark. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, mm. knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Mark, put your name in there. Walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. This is uniformitarianism, which I'm sure as an engineer you believe. And they are, for this they willingly are ignorant of. Willingly ignorant. They don't want to believe such a thing. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The Bible clearly teaches there was a worldwide flood, and the water came from within the earth. The earth, earth was built out of the water and in the water, according to Second Peter chapter 3. So I want to get to as much as I can here in my little opening here. The things to consider concerning the flood. A flood would leave evidence where a miracle would not. If God just said, all you sinners die, it wouldn't leave any evidence. This flood left enormous evidence all over the world, including a trazillion fossils all over the world. The effects are here today to still see. We have creatures like this, which you can go along the beach and pick them up and saw them in half, and they make absolutely beautiful. But they also find them fossilized identical, only bigger, nearly always bigger, sometimes much, much, much bigger. We have thousands of these in our museum. Come on down, Mark. We'll give you a tour and show you some real science, how fossils can form rapidly, and they had to be formed buried while the animal was still alive, like in the case of the mammoth, frozen standing up. And so anyway, we talk about that. But a flood would give warning time to give them a chance to repent. Have a pen, honey. God, said, God said, Noah, you got 100 years, build that boat, okay? So according to the Bible, the people before the flood lived to be over 900. And then that flood came <clears throat> about 1,600 years later, uh, according to the dates given in Genesis chapter 5. Noah lived to be 600 years before the flood, according to the dates given in the Bible. And there are plenty of legends of people living to be a thousand. It's called the Golden Age. I mean, many cultures talk about that. Uh, so the flood was about, let's see, slide number 74 here. Okay. Flood was about 1,600 years after the creation, which would be about 4,400 years ago. 4,400 years ago from today, there was a flood, according to the Bible, that destroyed everything and shortened everybody's lifespan. You notice after the flood here, the people only lived to be 400 and then 200 and then 100. Something changed, okay? And we cover that. So where did all this water come from? Well, according to the Bible, and whether you believe it or not, the Bible says there was water within the crust of the earth. I think anybody with a brain would say there is still water in the crust of the earth. That's why you can drill a, down a, drill a hole and get a well, and why there are sub subterranean uh, chambers and earthquakes, and they can sense the water down there. Chambers of water. God said there would be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and it would divide the waters from the waters. The original creation had a layer of water above, probably just a couple inches, a layer of air to breathe, probably 10 or 15 miles, which today has expanded out to 50 or 60, a layer of rocks and dirt to stand on, the crust of the earth, and then water under the crust of the earth. The Bible tells us the birds fly in the firmament, and there were lights in the firmament, and there was water above the firmament where the birds fly. So that's the creation position. Let me skip up to slide number 111. There, okay. Bible says, God, the earth is the Lord's, and he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. He laid up the depth in storehouses. This is what the book says. Now, whether you believe it or not, it's a different story. But the book teaches there was water within the crust of the earth. That's where it came shooting out in Genesis chapter 7. It says, the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. So most of the flood water, I believe, came from inside the earth. Some of it came from above, and it rained for 40 days, but the water kept coming up for 150 days. At the end of the flood, the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, according to Genesis chapter 8. The Bible says in Nehemiah, Thou didst divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. Talking about Moses crossing over the Red Sea. And he threw their prosecutors into the deep. The deep is always a reference to the ocean or a lot of water, okay, the flood, okay? Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Job, he makes the deep boil like a pot and makes the sea like a pot of ointment. So God laid the foundations of the earth, and he covered it, covered the earth with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. So according to Psalm 104 and hundreds of other verses, there was water within the crust and water above. And during the flood, the earth was completely covered by water. 
And there's enough water on the planet right now to completely cover the Earth about 8,000 feet deep. Ask any Earth science teacher, if you smoothed out the Earth, hit my globe there, would you please? If you just simply smooth out the Earth, and by the way, the Earth, if you, if you shrank it down to the size of a cue ball, you could not find Mount Everest. A five-mile mountain on an 8,000-mile Earth would become invisible at that scale. But if you shrank the Earth down, if you just simply smoothed it out today, the water, which today covers 70% of the world, would cover 100% of the world 8,000 feet deep, about a mile and a half. So there is plenty of water to flood the world. And where'd it go? It's still here. It's in the oceans, OK? The Bible says they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. So I think the water, the mountains came up, the water <clears throat> rushed off. What's that time up? No. Oh, I'm talking going to my fast. wife. Oh, OK. Tell I'm her watching her eat while I miss my dinner. Tell her you're going to make a great Christian too, okay? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Bible says in Psalm 104, God set a bound that the waters cannot pass over. I think that's the beach lines where the waters, oceans are kind of contained. It says in Psalm 136, he stretched out the earth above the waters. So the original creation had a layer of water above, probably just a few inches, a layer of air to breathe, dirt and rocks to stand on, and water inside. That's where most of the flood water came from. And this I could not prove, but I'm not asking for my theory to be taught at taxpayer expense in all the school systems. You guys are demanding that all of us pay for your religion to be taught. And evolution is a religion. It's not a bit of science behind it. I know you guys love it when I say that, but it's the truth. Okay. So probably maybe a half a mile, just guessing, of water trapped in the crust of the earth. That's where probably the majority of the flood water came from. There's a website, uh, Dr. Uh, Walt Brown from uh, Colorado uh, Air Force Academy. Uh, Officers Academy in Colorado. He taught physics there. <clears throat> He's got a great book called In the Beginning about the flood of the days of Noah. So what did all that water do? Well, the Bible says the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So the rain lasted 40 days, but if there was water underneath shooting up along the cracks, which today are called the fault lines, they still exist, the earth broke up like an eggshell, water came shooting out, that would cause the crust of the earth to settle down into the new void created by the water moving to the top. So basically, water under the earth, and now it's going to shift places. So the crust of the earth would sink in a little bit, quarter mile maybe, causing the earth to speed up in its spin. I think the earth has a little faster day now because it's spinning a little faster than it was in the time of, of uh, Noah or before that. See, a cubic foot of, water, of rock weighs about 160 pounds, sometimes 180, depending which kind of rock. So if you stacked it up 10 miles deep, that's uh, 58,000 PSI. That would cause the water underneath, once it finds a crack in a weak spot, to launch things out into space. Rocks could reach escape velocity, which is about 25,000 miles an hour at the surface of the Earth and gets weaker rapidly as you go out with the inverse square law. So I think maybe that's what caused the craters on the moon. The moon craters are very different on one side from the other. Some was hit directly, and some the moon is still hitting as it drifts around, hitting this, these rocks left drifting around out in space, probably from the flood. Some of the rocks came back and hit the earth, made big craters all over the place. Behringer Crater, uh, there was a big, huge one in Canada, it's 40, what, 48 miles across up there. So that's the Hovind theory that the earth was uh, destroyed by a flood. Let me jump up to 173. There we go. Uh, as the water escaped underneath, it would go, it widened the crack by simple erosion, eventually causing the center part underneath to bulge up. Isostatic rebound, it's called. And that would, as this bulged up, it would slide the continents away. And all over the world, especially up in Canada, they see some really good examples of folded mountain ranges. If you get up and look at the uh, folds in these rocks, there are no internal fracture marks. These were all folded while they were soft, and then they hardened. If they had been folded after each layer was hard, there would be fracture marks internally, and there aren't. I've seen them with a magnifying glass. There are no internal fracture marks in there. So the fault lines we see today <clears throat> are probably still where the fountains of the deep broke open. So the creation position is very simple. God made it all in six days. High pressure water, troughs of water, have weigh less than the, the waves do. This compression and rarefraction of just wave today causes a phenomenon called liquefaction. You can go stand at the beach, walk out knee deep in the water, just stand there, don't move. Every time the wave comes by, it compresses and releases the pressure on the sand, causing sand grains to hop on top. You stand there five minutes and you'll be ankle deep in sand without moving a muscle. It'll start to bury you with a process called liquefaction. Buildings sometimes fall in after earthquakes. When there's earthquake and it shakes the ground and all the ground becomes like soup and everything sinks in. Here's a car got swallowed up by liquefaction. The shaking of the ground can do that. 
can do amazing things. They're gonna, you can sort things rapidly with water. We have a demonstration we do here at our science center in Lenox, Alabama, where you shake uh, jars up with different materials in there. It always settles in layers according to density. Now they're gonna tell the kids in school, the top layer is younger than the bottom layer. That is absolute insanity. I say, guys, hold it. You're telling Time. me this layer's younger? Where did it come from? Outer space? That no, all the layers are the same age. I got to run out of time. Here. Okay, minutes. thank you so much. Thank Go you so it, much. All right, we'll jump right into the open discussion. Floor is yours, Mark. Where do you even start? Well, I'm watching your money pour in at least, James. So you're getting some good donations tonight and lots of questions for Kent. So I'm glad to see that. Um, there is absolutely no evidence for the uh, for the flood. So let's start with, um, uh, wow, rocks being launched out into space and water. Explain that to me, Kent. And no, um, the speed of what's needed for escape velocity um, is merely something falling around the Earth. It actually increases as you get further away from the Earth. It does not um, lessen. Um, gravity lessens, but not the speed that needed to obtain a higher orbit so yes you are right at i think it's about 23 24 thousand miles per hour um at at uh, sea level and it starts to go up from there so explain to me how we're going to get water and rocks to launch out so just so you know uh top of my head mathematics uh, about 30, 32 times the speed of sound we've got some water and rocks heading towards outer space how's that going to work ken well, would you agree that a cubic foot of rock weighs about 160 to 180 pounds? Are you on the metric system or English? Nah, I can do either. I really don't okay. care. Here, an engineer. So a cubic foot of rock, uh, granite weighs about 180. I think limestone weighs about 160. If you stacked them up 10 miles high, I, I'm sure I did the math right. I taught math and science for years. And, I, and, and you are simply completely mistaken about escape velocity increasing as you get distance from the Earth. You better go back and study that one again. That's dead wrong. Uh, Escape velocity lessens because gravity is less as it goes out. Nope. But I'll bet you a steak dinner on that one, Mark. You want to take me up on it? Hundred grand. If you want to 100. increase, if you want to increase your orbital distance away from the Earth, you need to increase speed. I agree with that. But I said escape velocity lessens at the surface of the Earth. It's about 24, 25,000 miles an hour. If if you were up. 100 miles above the Earth, escape velocity would be less because gravity is less. That's what I said. So that's my point was, as the material was ejected off the planet from the fountains of the deep breaking open, and 58,000 PSI, 30 tons per square inch, would indeed launch things up there. I'm, but see, I'm not asking for my theory to be taught in schools at taxpayer expense. I don't have to prove any of this. You guys are saying the Bible's wrong, and you're welcome to say that. I'm saying evolution is wrong. And the idea of millions of years is wrong. And the idea of the layers being different ages is wrong. It's up to you to prove. You say their top layer is younger. Did it come from outer space? How could it possibly be younger? All the layers had to form rapidly. You get a jar with sand, rocks, gravel, mud, shake it up. It'll settle into the same strata formations every time. Gravel's at the bottom, then sands, then clays, then silts. This is simple hydrologic sorting. The top layer is not younger than the bottom layer. You need to come to Dinosaur Adventureland, see some of our science experiments. Okay, so steak dinner, I don't have a hundred grand or I'd, or I'd certainly bet you that because I, I got to have it to bet it, but I, I can afford a steak dinner. Escape velocity yeah, less. To achieve higher altitude. orbits, you need higher speeds. That's what moves you out. You want to go out further away from the earth, you increase your speed, you go out into a higher orbit. But at no, any rate. Talking, that's not talking escape velocity. That's talking orbital velocity. If they speed up the space shuttle, it goes further out. I agree with that. I said escape velocity. Okay, so what That's speed different. is the water? What speed is the water and rocks coming out of the earth at, at sea oh. level? What's what speed? I don't know. My point was if you had thirty thousand or thirty tons per square inch, which is nothing thousand PSI. Which is nothing. Which is nothing? No, the the, the barrel pressure of an AR fifteen, I actually made AR fifteens for the Canadian military is thirty thousand PSI. We we cannot achieve anything even close to escape it, sending bullets out into outer space. You've got to sure. come up with a hell of a lot more pressure than 30,000 30, PSI to get a rock into outer space. Don't forget the second it has been ejected from the earth, 
It no longer has any more energy put into it. It has to put up with the thickness of the atmosphere, which I, I agree is, is uh, decreasing as it goes up. But the second it comes out of the crust of the earth, it is going to be faced with something that it is going to view as basically a concrete block at three, 30 times the speed of sound. Can you imagine what a rock would do at 30 to 40 times the speed of sound when it hits Earth's atmosphere? It's going to view it like it's solid concrete. It would explode at that speed. And we know that because let's go the other way. Let's bring a comet back into Earth's atmosphere. Let's bring it down. Yes, it comes in. It starts to glow. The air gets thicker as it the uh, altitude decreases. And in most cases, it explodes when it gets to the point. Just because, again, Kent, it views it almost like solid concrete. Just like if you think you're going to jump out of a jetliner and hit the ocean and live, you're not. The 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 water is barely going to deform at a terminal velocity of about 120 miles an hour. You're going to hit it like it's. you might as well hit a road. So I really am confused about how you think that 30 times the speed of sound is going to get you into outer space. But that's not the only point. The water you're talking about 10 miles down is going to be at about 400 degrees, Ken. What, what, what's going to happen? We're talking about the flood. So we're releasing water. And let's explain to the uh, audience and the uh, theists out there why it is in the Bible that uh, we have people of, of old, ignorant people before they understood. I think uh, Aaron, basically Aaron Raw covers it the best, ignorant, superstitious savages. Um, of course, they thought that there was water under the earth. They would dig a hole and they would find water. How would it, would ignorant people with lacking science explain where water came from falling on their heads? They would watch storms go through. They would never be able to figure this out. But you have 400 degree water from 10 kilometers down i'm in kilometers so 10 miles is uh uh 16 kilometers down you've got water coming out of the earth at 400 degrees mixing with the oceans that's where you're saying the flood came from how are these fishes living how are the whales living how are the dolphins living kent we you know you talked about this uh this boiling cauldron of water that's exactly what you would have you would have nothing living when our oceans raise two degrees we've got a mass extinction on our hands explain it well you've asked about 14 questions which one would you like to discuss can we go one at a time here please i think number I one through 14 you name my 14 questions <laughs> name them off i'll give you all the time you want i would really like to know where is the, how are these animals dealing with this extreme temperature? Are you trying to tell well, me that the, the, the center of the, um, uh, of our earth has gotten cooler in the last 4,000 years, um, 4,400 well, years? The, I didn't say the center of the earth. I said about 10 miles down. No, I'm okay. saying the center. So it would have to be cooler right now. Anything down um your 10 miles or 16 kilometers is going to come out at about 450 degrees uh fahrenheit that sounds reasonable ask your wife if you, if you have a pressure cooker you ever heard of a pressure cooker well i don't need is to ask my wife i know what a pressure cooker is okay is it possible to go above 212 degrees fahrenheit or 100 degrees centigrade or 273 Celsius kelvin without the water turning to, to vapor? Is it possible? Has, to have nothing water? To, has nothing to do with my question. So to get it back on to my to question, um, let's say I have a fish tank here that holds 10 gallons and I ask my wife to add five gallons of 400 degrees Fahrenheit water to my fish tank. What's going to happen to my little fishies? Oh, great question. Let's see, 129. Uh, it's going to kill them within a certain effective radius. If hot water came out of the ocean floor, like the Bible teaches it did, that hot water would kill things within a certain effective radius. As it goes out, it dissipates, the temperature drops. It might kill everything within 100 miles. Did you know they find an awful lot of fish fossils and sea, sea dwelling animals fossilized? Animals, petrified clams in the closed position are found by the billions around the world. Billions of petrified closed clams. They encountered something that made them clam up and die in the closed position where today, Clams open, you walk along the beach, you find a million seashells, but you don't find them closed. 
Once they die, they open. They have Can to we cover that something. now? Can What's I that? cover that? What, petrified closed clams? Well, no, not These petrified are... closed clams. So let me explain that to you, Kent. I, I've been watching the uh, questions go by. They see my drums in the background. They know I do animals. They know I'm an engineer. And I think I've seen some comments. What doesn't this guy do? Well, I also dive. And here's the facts, Kent. Yes, when you walk along a beach, you see many clams opened up and separated. That is from the waves. When you are in the ocean and you do some diving, they do not open when they die. They fall to the bottom and they get buried by sediment, sediment and they get buried. Of course, when you walk along a beach, you see open clams. Why wouldn't you? They're going in and out with the waves. That has nothing to do with what happens out in the oceans at uh, 5,000 feet. Why would we even think that? There's very little moving water at 5,000 feet. Ken, they die, oh, they Mark, get buried. It, hold it, one at a time. If you've been diving at 5,000 feet, you ought to be- No, I haven't. Record. Okay, very good, okay. You're telling me, you're telling the audience here that when clams die underwater, they stay closed. Is that your position? Absolutely, they stay together. They don't break apart. It, whether they you know open what? or not is is not the issue. You are it claiming the that they I'm break holding, in. I'm holding one that's closed and petrified. This is the issue. As soon as it dies, the mus it's a muscle inside here. They call them muscles. When the muscle relaxes, the shells come apart and something eats it. Uh, they st it may still be attached, but that's not what I said. You're trying to shift the burden of proof here. I've said they're closed and petrified on top of Mount Everest. Thousands of these are found on top of mountain ranges. In Peru, two miles above sea level, they find 11-foot oysters closed, petrified. Why Something wouldn't they? Something radical happen. Of course they do, and that goes against your belief. The bottom of Ma Mount Everest, we've already said, used to be an ocean bottom, and it got pushed up when the tectonic plates pushed together. We would expect that. You're you're backing our position. But what you're doing okay. is, is you're putting to your... No, Kent, you laugh. We have always it's said that the top we have tectonic why do you think mountain ranges are at the sides of that tectonic plates it's because they're pushing into each other and they're pushing the seafloor up correct why are the mountains going up because the, the plates are moving why are they moving mark because one's sliding other moving? and one's moving up and we are continuously why, why? because we are continuously getting new seafloor bottoms which is at the ridges. We know that. We see it happening every day. We know the exact spot in the middle of the ocean that part of the ocean floor is heading east and part of it's heading west. That I is going to push the continents into each other. When you have a tectonic plate going under another tectonic plate, it's going to push it up. I agree. I'm asking you, where is the, you're an engineer for heaven's sake. Where's the energy coming to move these billions of tons of rock? Why are they the moving center of the earth, all? Kent? Do you know how hot it is down there? We got molten rock down there. Oh, you just yeah. you just explained that if you were to take the um, the scale of that globe in front of you and convert it, the crust is only the thickness of a paper, which is right. four thou um, four thousandths of an inch. Okay, so what do you mean where is the energy coming from? It's coming from the center of the earth. We continually know and we see tectonic plates pushing under continental plates. So you right. do know that the ocean, the ocean floor is made out of different material. It's basalt. You know that's different than continental plates, right? Because I've heard you talk about this before. And I, I'm not sure that you understand that we have um, we have different bottoms. You talk about how um, continents don't float around like lilies in a pond. Actually, that's exactly what they do. They are lighter and they do float and that's why they are floating. Okay, well, I'll go back to my theory that I've taught for many years. You are correct. Underneath the crust of the earth, there is a layer of basalt. When the flood took place, the basalt would bulge up into the gap that would get wider and wider as the water escaped, and the water would provide lubrication for the continents to plates to slide. The basalt is now exposed, sometimes even on land, but generally at the ocean floor, you are correct. The sideways movement sliding until the water was all gone, the lubrication was gone, is what caused the folded mountains. That's what I said. The, what, you have to have a mechanism. Go to uh, creationscience.com, uh, Walt Brown's website, to PhD in physics, taught at the Air Force Academy. These are pictures are from his website. Uh, 
the, the mechanism to move the continents, to compress the mountains laterally, is, and all the mountain ranges run parallel to the coastlines. The Rocky Mountains, the Alps, the Andes Mountains follow the Pacific. The mountain ranges follow the coastlines because they both formed at the same time because of the same thing. The crust of the earth broke open, the water came out, the plate slid around, I agree. Some are still moving a little bit. Uh, Mount Everest is about 10 feet taller than it was when I was a kid, I agree. But that can just as easily be explained by a flood. And as I've mentioned several times, I don't think you're getting it. I'm not demanding that my theory be taught. You guys are demanding your theory to be taught at taxpayer expense to everybody, whether they believe it or not, because you don't believe in the flood. And the Bible says the fountains of the deep were broken up and that's what, and the windows of heaven were open. 30,000, you talked about the AR-15 AR or whatever it is, it only gets up to, uh, what, uh, I forget the velocity of the bullet coming out the end of the barrel. And I agree, it slows down right away. But uh, rocks Under escaping the speed from of the sound. earth. Subsonic. What is it? Sub, I know it's subsonic. Well, there are bullets that are supersonic. Not an AR-15. An AR-15 is a two two three okay. bullet. It's subsonic. Which ones are supersonic? I don't know. Look it up. I he honestly says don't know. There, there's not the, many. That's, that's extremely fast. I, I know that it doesn't sound fast, but Ken, just to give your audience an idea, a bullet is subsonic. So it's less than 750 miles or whatever yeah, I'm the sorry, number is, sir, 749 are, at sea you're level. You're uninformed or mistaken. That is, many bullets are supersonic. Okay? I didn't say they weren't, Kent. Okay. I don't know about okay. the AR-15. What I, I am care, saying to you is I am, I am trying to explain to your audience that a bullet is subsonic, which means it's up. Some may be over. That's fine. The average bullet out of a rifle is subsonic, which means it's traveling under 750 miles an hour. Kent is suggesting rocks and water coming out of the center of the earth traveling at 32 times the speed of sound we cannot push titanium through earth's atmosphere at that speed without it melting down we can't get even close to six times the speed of sound without titanium breaking down i would agree now if there were the biblical view is correct not only would this water be rushing out in great quantity, just like when you Kent, get a rapid Kent, snowfall through a warm Kent. atmosphere, some melts, but it gets a cold channel through the atmosphere. You could get a channel through the air where it would it, and, and enable some of the particles to get out. Anybody that knows physics going? understands that. Okay, so let's talk about physics. So again, I am an engineer. I have to build machinery that actually works. I can't hand it to my customer and say, well, if you, if you, completely change everything that we see in the physical world my machine will work okay so there is a reason that we do not use water and rocks to launch um satellites into orbit to start with kent there is absolutely no way that water hitting atmosphere at sea level would make it to outer space impossible just cannot happen we cannot have water or rocks traveling at 32 times the speed of sound with the dense with air density at sea level so i need you just to tell the audience not to jump around it how are these rocks getting out and then okay, we're going to get into the fact that you're telling me you're showing me the <coughs> mid-atlantic ridge is that where the water came from kent if it is yes. the water would come out the 10 feet of rock would sink down on the 10 feet of water and now you would simply have displacement there would be no increase whatsoever in the water level the sea floor would drop 10 miles of rock would drop into a 10 mile void of water and the two would change places this makes no sense what you are can, can you laugh doesn't. what you are explaining is actually water escaping from the earth you're getting rid of water if water is making it to space and the sea floor is dropping and water is being pushed out from under the earth you actually have less water to make this flood okay mark let me explain to you if the water and the if the rock if the water escapes and ends up on top right the people drowned in the water that's no they the wouldn't flood. because it's kent it's the mid read your 
No, don't laugh. Kent, people are going to see this. I have to this. laugh. It's dumb. Kent, Come on, you're an engineer. No, back, back, Kent. Go back to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge picture. Got it. Mid-Atlantic right okay. Ridge. Got it. There's so what happens, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there's a reason we call it that. And that is right. that it is the, the back, right there. So what happens if all that at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was to drop 10 kilometers into 10 kilometers deep water? Tell me exactly where the earth to the east and the west would end up with any extra water. If the water's on top, it drowns everybody. No, it doesn't. You oh, have it okay. deeper. You can't. You're about to lose this. You will never bring this up again. And we have been listening to this from you for 30 years. If okay. the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is where you are saying the water comes from, okay, and that Mid-Atlantic Ridge, no, I know why you're getting rid of the picture, drops 10 kilometers into 10 kilometers of water, you have not increased water height at all. All you have done is lowered the seafloor. Okay. If you have rock on top of water and they trade places, the people drowned in the water that's now on top. I don't understand. You're willingly ignorant, Second Peter said. You, you named that one just exactly right. Kent, of course, the, the water didn't go anywhere. It's still on Earth. It's just it's Kent, in the oceans. The oceans are Kent, huge. Kent, you're a smart guy. I know you're a smart guy. You know exactly what I'm saying. People do not live in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. If the seafloor in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean drops 10 kilometers to displace 10 kilometers of water, you have not raised water on the continents. You have lowered the sea floor. You, I, you have not increased clear the... Con okay. okay. Mark, Mark, that changing places with the water in the rock does not increase the diameter of the earth. I never said that. It would decrease the, the center of mass because rock is heavier than water. Water going, with the rock dropping down 10 kilometers or 10 miles would certainly increase the speed. The spin of the earth would go a little faster, like an ice skater when they pull their arms in, they spin faster. Who but cares? is it possible, Mark, is it possible to spray a hose, a fire hose, right through a fire? Could you spray a column of water, which is less than 212 degrees, through, all the way through and come out the other side? Could you spray a hose of water through uh, a 1,000 degree fire? I could spray it through a 10,000 degree water uh, fire with fire. water. I Bingo. really wouldn't. You're getting it. Okay. No, I'm not getting anything, Kent. You, oh, okay. you well, just, I, you I really hate to say you just, you know, your people can laugh in the background. I am going to hold you to this till the point okay. that you, that you threaten to quit. If in the middle of the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, which is about four or 5,000 miles wide, if the sea floor drops and pushes, yep, hold your hand up, that's the sea floor. Right, right. Sea floor okay. drops. Now, under your 10 kilometers or 10 miles, sorry, 16 kilometers of crust, you have, let's say, 10 kilometers of water. Right. You have now dropped your 10 kilometers of water or of, no. of crush cross we've switched places it's now hey, on top kent you just nailed it you switch places where's the extra water where's the extra water to cover the continents where's it it's not from? mark mark it's not extra water the water was underneath it's now on top and now you just have right a, now. now you just now you just have a lower sea floor where is the water to cover the continents you've just switched places you have now dropped your sea floor 10 kilometers you now don't have 10 kilometers of water under your sea floor you now have an ocean that instead of 8,000 miles deep is now 18. what just, have we gained in water to cover the continents just want to we okay. have just a few minutes left before my scheduled 7.30 uh, Q&A time for our YouTube channel, Kent Hovind Official. People can come there. Mark, let's do round two on this one. I don't know how you're not getting it, that if they trade places, the sea floor is lower, but the water's on top of it. They're going to drown in the new water that's not on top. 
I don't Ken, I don't understand it. Ken, okay. I don't know why you're backing out already. I'm telling you when the, the time is up, drop, I'm not backing out. I'll go around two, three, four, five, six, seven with you, Mark. Okay, Ken, Come down. nobody you can sit beside me. Come nobody to nobody next. lives in the center of the Atlantic Ocean. You are claiming that in the center of the Atlantic Ocean, at the mid Atlantic Ridge, okay, that the seafloor drops ten kilometers am i oh, correct the continents the continents drop why are, are they cracks. dropping would, would, would you agree there are fault lines all over the world like forty-seven thousand miles worth of fault lines okay but what yeah and they're not in the middle of continents no they're mostly in the ocean floor that's my point exactly so are right, you telling me it. are you telling me at one point the continents were floating around on top of water are you saying this yes. layer of yes. water they 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 still are in many cases there is subterranean water many miles down no there's not okay do some research hey well, Kent, let's schedule your let's your schedule people can two. your people can laugh all they want there are no oceans of oceans under the ground we have ground water we have water that is within the crust of the earth that is embedded in the soils, it's embedded in the rocks. We do not have vast quantities of open water under the earth. Tell you what, research I that a little one. bit. Call, call me later and apologize, but you can research that. There are 10 oceans worth of water in the crust of the earth, according to Japanese scientists. It may be, this. It, it may be Kent, but they're not oceans of oceans. There are not big, vast caverns of oceans. You are talking about water that is it that is in the rocks it is in the soils it is in we do not see oceans of oceans we would know this we drill for oil kent where right. are these oceans where are these lakes of water under the ground tell me of one where there's you can't have it water will uh, rocks will not float on water go down to your local pond and throw a rock in it sinks to the bottom it doesn't okay. float on water uh, mark i lived in longview texas for five years there are thirty thousand oil wells in greg county the smallest county in texas ask anybody who drills for oil deep wells do you ever drill down and hit pockets of water where the drill just drops in they'll all say yes there are huge pockets of water in the crust of the earth I got another meeting at 7:30. Could you please reschedule at least one more, two more, ten more, if you'd like, or come to come to Lenox, Alabama, sit right beside me. We'll let the audience discuss all this. I think everybody here is saying very clearly, you're not making sense on this water. That much weight of rock on top of water would indeed shoot things out at escape velocity. We're talking 30 tons per square inch, 60,000 pounds per square inch. That would make things reach escape velocity. That's all. But I'm not asking my theory to be taught at taxpayer expense. There was a flood. And the Bible said there would be scoffers who would be ignorant of the flood. Welcome and to the flood, Mark. We He's doing can't another one. Claim, can't, one, one you can't claim that a rock is going to be able to go through Earth's atmosphere at 32 times the speed of sound without okay, exploding. Mark, how, you, how are you explaining this, Ken? Okay, you admitted that you could shoot a fire hose of less than 212 degree water through a 10,000 degree fire. If you Why had enough rocks and water to? going one direction, it would make a channel through the atmosphere. Plus, as it goes up and expands, the air expands, making it less dense, lessening the problem. I'm sure the physics has all been worked out. Walt Brown, physics professor at Air Force Academy, his book uh, is fabulous on this topic. And I uh, don't have a copy here. Anyway, we have to quit. Let's do round two. Uh, can you do that, James? Schedule one soon? We can definitely do round two. Uh are you able to stick around for question and answer? We uh, my Q and A starts in in four minutes. We'll work through as many as we can, and then we will schedule okay, you guys for next time. Uh, I'm going to try to skim through these to try to get through, uh, ignoring any of the ones that are like Stephen hitting on me. So uh, let's see, Mothra J Disco, thanks for your super chat. They said Kent says he. Ooh, okay, let's see. That one's not particularly related to the debate. Uh, Mothra J. Disco, for Mark, would you rather own a pet lion, leopard, or tiger? I have all three. 
Gotcha. Maynard <laughs> Sage, thanks for your, for your super chat. They said, I like he, lions the most. Lions are my favorite. They are the most like dogs. They are the most trainable, and um, I find them by far to be the smartest and the most. Um, uh, if you go on YouTube, you'll see me interact with them. All Excellent. I have is a cat named Trump. We got him to keep the rats out, and he's a lazy slob, and you can have him if you want him. Come on down. Gotcha. He, uh, Maynard <laughs> Saves, thanks for your super chat. They said, who was the flood for? Who was before and after, according to Genesis 6-4? What extra, extraterrestrials mated with Earth girls? Wow. I assume that's for me. The Bible says Noah and his family of eight went on there, his three sons and their wives. That would be three mating couples. No extraterrestrials involved at all. Who on earth came up with a question like that? Gotcha. Next up, uh, let's see. N-A-N-A, -A, uh, thanks for your super chat. I think they're a fan of yours, Mark. They said, The Great Flood, my favorite fairy tale. If you want to respond, mm -hmm. you can, Kent. You don't have to if you don't want to. Oh, if you, he can believe it's a fairy tale if he wants. I'll see him Judgment Day, and God will explain it to him. This is an older version of In the Beginning by Walt Brown about the flood and the physics of it, and there's a much newer version on our website, drdino.com. Schedule round two. We got one minute left. We got to go for another Q and A program. I'm sorry, I'm late. I, I didn't leave the hospital till five this morning. I was there. They thought a vein in my neck was going to explode. Turned out to be a false alarm. I'm perfectly fine. You atheists, I'm going to be around for a long time. <laughs> okay. gotcha thank you very much uh with that thanks for being here everybody it's been a uh, it's been an exciting one we will attempt to schedule round three and thanks for being here everybody uh we will try to schedule in more q a next time we appreciate your questions and just for hanging out here it's been a pleasure so keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable take care everybody have critics and we want to make sure we don't become an echo chamber. So it's like, hey, like, let's let the critics like mingle, uh, like, you know, and which the mods have done a good job. Uh, like I very rarely ever see somebody block. Uh, so I also appreciate, though, in addition to the critics, that so many of you are so supportive and just kind. And, you know, remember when we used to have those audio problems like every freaking stream? It was terrible. And oh, it was embarrassing, but you guys are so kind and patient. So anyway, that was one among many things that I'm thankful for. So with that, I want to encourage you to keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Mark has a link for a GoFundMe for his animals. So uh, I want to mention, I, I had mentioned, like, you'll get to hear more of Mark. Uh, he may have, I think if I remember right, you said you might open up a YouTube channel, Mark. And uh, But in the meantime, there is a GoFundMe down there if you'd like to give to support his animals and... In addition to that, we are uh, obviously we have good old Nephilim free down there. And then John from the Great Debate community wanted me to ask if you guys would be willing to come on to there. Uh, I will send you guys the link via email. And also, we just really appreciate you guys being here. So, uh, yeah, I encourage you guys to go party at the Great Debate community. And with that, keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Uh, take care. Thanks so much, Neff and Mark. Thank you, James. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.